Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, it's, it's a, a pleasure, pleasure to meet everyone, everyone here. here. Um, so, so my, my name is Mike Schenke. Schenke. I'm part of Dynamo, Dynamo or as, as recently due to the acquisition with Ansys, I'm part, part of the Ansys family, family now. And I welcome everyone and also the people online. Um, we have like 30, 35 people here on site and I think we had at least 200 online applications, which is pretty cool. And it actually shows how much people are interested in this kind of topics yeah, today. We're going to talk about um, human body modeling. And um, let me start the whole thing with a lot personal story. Um, a couple of years ago, um, pretty much around the same time as a year in a year, I uh, basically went snowboarding. Yeah, so it was pretty nice weather, so spring weather was really cool. And um, during the day I fell on my snowboard and I hurt my wrist a little bit. Yeah, so that's something I worry about because usually I fell a lot, so we had like sprained angles and nothing serious. But this time, um, actually when I I completed the whole day, so of course you have to finish the whole skiing day, right? So you don't stop right in between. So I finished the whole day, went to the hotel, and at the night um, I felt a really hard pain in my wrist. So it didn't come better, so I couldn't bear the sleep at all. So then I decided the next day, okay, let's go to the, to the hospital. Yeah, and I went to the hospital, and they did an MRI scan of my hand. Yeah, so basically this is indeed, this is my wrist. What? Where is it here? Yeah, this is my wrist, and. You, you cannot, cannot see so much, much from this one, yeah? If, if I go a little bit, turn to the, the side, side, you see something, probably there's something off on this one here, yeah? yeah. And, and if, if you take a look, look on the scan, you see this one here, yeah? yeah. So, so actually, basically, on that fell, I broke my scaphoid bone in the wrist. And every time I see this picture, I think, like, okay, this is a huge bone, and it's, like, causing a lot of troubles. Um, but actually, after this, after um, the therapy, I had to go to a physiotherapist. And this is the first time I actually saw the, the sizes of these bones in the in the wrist in, in real size. Yeah, so, so I noticed that this bone actually is pretty small compared to other bones. So and I was wondering two things. So first of all, thinking, okay, how is it possible that such a bone, a small bone, breaking, causing so much trouble, not even during the curing part of the, of the um, injury, but also afterwards. I mean, after two or three months, I still felt the pain in this little bone. The this first thing lesson I learned. The second one is if you ever try break something in your um, any bone in your body, you have to do it off season. Yeah, literally. When I went to the hospital, uh, it took me about 20 minutes in the hospital and out again. Yeah, so it was super fast, which is not so common actually if you go to the emergency ward, right? Away. So, yeah. so I was thinking, okay, why does it happen that such a small break, such a small bone, causing so many troubles for such a long time? And then it came to my mind, okay. The human, human body is actually a super well-adjusted system of interacting problems, or interacting um, um, systems. Yeah? So there's, and this is actually the most challenging part when it comes to human body modeling. Yeah? You have complex biological tissues, yeah? uh, different types. You have skin, bone, cartilage, and so on. You have muscles, ligaments. Yeah? You do have like microstructural behavior, which scales up to the microscopic behavior, thinking about some kind of osmotic effects taking place. And the most important part, every body is different. Yeah, so each body is different from the other one. Yeah, so some pain, which some problems which cause pain in one person may not cause any pain in the other person. So, so it's a very difficult, uh, a very um, complex system. Yeah, and it's really, really hard to, to keep track of this one. And when you think about this one, and we're talking about here about simulation technology, um, you have to keep in mind all these problems. Yeah? And usually when you do simulation, um, you're trying to think about what is the problem you actually want to model. Yeah, there are various approaches to model something. Yeah? You can go to the very large scale, to the macro scale. Yeah? You can simulate something like this here. Yeah? Then you think, okay, I want to have a detailed um, um, idea of what is happening in the joint, yeah? then probably you do a very detailed model of the joint, you do investigations here, or you can go even further down and you maybe want to know, okay, what's happening on the bone level? Yeah? What's happening with the microstructure? What's happening with the transport of nutrition, blood vessels, and these kind of things? Yeah? And all these kind of approaches require a different modeling approach. Yeah? I mean, it's not possible to somehow scaling up this really small uh, bone structure modeling to a whole human body modeling. You have to find some kind of abstraction all the time. Yes, you're going to idealize some of the problems. And um, there's a pretty famous quote from George E.P. Box, and he actually said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Yeah, and basically, this summarizes greatly the idea of simulation technology. So basically, every time, whatever every model you create is basically wrong, 
but it suits a certain purpose, which you have in mind as a simulation engineer. Yeah? And this is actually one of the tricky parts in simulation technology. Find a certain abstraction level of your problem, which is good enough to fulfill its purpose, but not overcomplicating things. Yeah? And you also see today, um, we have many different um, talks covering a great variety of problems. We have some talks covering more like the macro scale, yeah? the whole human body models. We have some parts which are more focusing on some particular part in the human body, let's say muscles, for instance, and we're going down to the really micro scale to see what kind of effects are happening there. Yeah? So this is the program from today. Um, I'm not going through all of this right now, but the important part is we're going to have a one hour lunch break at 12.15, and then we have another half an hour coffee break in the afternoon. Yeah, so especially for the people online, just keep these dates in mind. Yeah, so there will be a break for one hour and a lunch break, and then half an hour in the, um, in the afternoon. Okay, um, also for the online audience, um, we're going to stream the whole event live on YouTube. Yeah, so if you have questions, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. They will be forwarded to me, and I'm trying to ask the questions to the speaker as a representative um, in favor of you. And a uh, little bit about Dynamo. Um, the most important part is, I guess, the acquisition of Dynamo. Oops. Here. Going back here yeah, is the acquisition of Dynamo through ENSYS, which happened in January this year. Um, Dynamo still has the headquarter in Stuttgart and a couple of uh, wide further offices around the globe, across Europe mostly. And what we're actually focusing on, still we are focusing on LS Dyna, but not on the product itself, but also on the LS Dyna ecosystem, yeah, which includes also what? Sorry. Yeah. So LS Dyna, um, we have the whole. Um, LS Dynab stuff. Why is it changing? Okay, um, LS Opt, of course, LS Task, LS Prepost, LS Dyna, some supplementary tools but like the Dynamo tools, which help you to somehow deal with the error message of LS Dyna, make your life easier as a service engineer. Um, we have uh, NVO, which is a mapping tool, and of course, we have dummies, barriers, yeah, and today we also talk about a new human body modeling, yeah, which is the Hans, but you will see later. Okay, um, we also provide services like engineering service, benchmark projects, um, <laughs> mapping of process, simulation data. We do development in LS Dyna, so implementing new models, um, improving models, bug fixes, and so on. We do trainings, of course, we do conferences like this one, promotion events, and we also do material modeling. We have a um, material competence center, which is responsible for testing and uh, material model calibration. We are more than 150 mostly pretty much international. This is a list of our some of the customers, mostly automotive driven. Uh, uh, these are huge customers and uh, so, uh, their suppliers. And I also want to point out that if you take something away today, um, maybe you also want to part, take part in our conference, which is taking place in Baden-Baden uh, in fall this year, which is a European conference this time. It will be again hybrid conference, so it's online and on site. But of course, we welcome everyone who is deciding, okay, I want to be online. Okay, so with that being said, that's uh, my part for now. And I want to introduce the first speaker, uh, it's Karen. She was uh, first a university professor at Charms University in Sweden, and now she's a consultant researcher at, um, what was it, Lightness by Design, right? And she will give us an introduction into um, overview about human body modeling. So can you hear me? Perfect. And I will try not to get tangled in the cord. I'm usually a little bit vivid with my arms. So will you give me a note when there's like, so there's at least five minutes left for questions? Thank you. So first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak uh, at this conference. I will try to give you an overview um, of sort of the state of the art models here today and where they've, where all this modeling has come from from the beginning. And, and it's by no means a complete uh, overview. So uh, brief is a key word here. <laughs> so I'm from Lightness by Design. It's a small expert consultancy firm um, in Sweden. So the red dot is Stuttgart, approximately. Um, and we have two offices. I sit in German uh, or in, in Gothenburg, which is the small 
point there, and the rest of Leibniz by design is in Stockholm. And most of us are P have PhDs, so we take on sort of uh, interesting projects. And uh, this, the images are just representing sort of topics um, uh, where we are working on. And I'm, of course, here in the human body modeling and biomechanics, together with my colleague Victor. So, to human body models, or HBMs. So for auto, this is sort of for automotive applications is where they uh, really started off. In the 1960s, the first two-dimensional models came. Um, and they were sort of spring dash pot models to represent cadaveric studies uh, so that the researchers could plan before running a cadaveric study, they could plan and test setups. So they used these two-dimensional models. Then in the 70s came the first two- and three-dimensional multi-body models. So now we're getting closer to sort of the uh, finite element <laughs> models, but it's multi-body models. Um, and they were also mostly from the beginning to plan cadaveric experiments, and the, and the knowledge used for research came from the cadaveric experiments. Uh, but as the modeling got better and better, um, there's a lots of drawbacks, of course, with cadaveric studies because you can never repeat it. Because, as was mentioned in the introduction, all people are different. So if you test one person and then test another, then you don't know if the difference is because the changes you did in your test setup or if it's because of the individual variations of the people being tested. And that's sort of the really, really big benefit uh, of human body models, whether it's multi-body models or FE models is we can really control the parameters. We can say, this model has this parameter, and then we can see what happens if we change the seat belt stiffness, and, and, and really do comparisons just looking at that. Or if we change the, the dashboard geometry, uh, or if we add an airbag, if we add a pretensioner, and so on. So in the 70s, two- and three-dimensional multibody models were used for research. And here you can see one with an, um, with an uh, airbag in the image. In 85 came, this is not a human body model, it's the first full vehicle crash. Um, and as you can see, the mesh uh, has changed quite a lot. So a lot has happened since 85. To me, 85 is not that uh, far ago, but uh, I guess for some of you, it feels like it's like the dinosaurs who walked on Earth in 85. Um, but it's actually been quite a rapid development, and it's sort of followed the development of computer capacity. So that's essentially what it shows. The number of elements, as soon as we get a stronger computer, a more powerful computer, we add more elements to our models. Uh, so we always lack computer capacity, and it's always slow. But it's sort of our own fault. Um, in the 90s, the first really anatomically detailed body segments were uh, starting to develop. Uh, I did my PhD um, at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm in the 90s. So I developed, for my PhD, the top three. I think actually maybe even, can I borrow this? So it's really nice. So this was my PhD <laughs> to make a model of the first and the second cervical vertebrae and the complex movements with the skull base. And, and sort of that's what, what we could do with the computer capacity then. We could add that level of detail, but then we could study not much more than just the neck or just these are two different head and brain models also being developed. So a lot of different body parts were being developed, but it wasn't really possible to combine them and run full body HBM. So a lot of studies was done here to uh, sort of understand what goes on in the biomechanics in the, in the different body parts in CRASH. But it's still very purely research. And then um, this century, started the development of full human body models. And in Europe, we had the HUMUS project with lots of different uh, countries involved. Um, it was a, a, a French cadaver that was donated to, to science that was frozen and sliced thinly. 
and he was sitting at a little bit of an awkward angle. Um, so especially the neck, which was my part to work on, was not very representative. So sort of that's the drawback of that, that we always sort of have when we are going to create models. Who are we making the model from? So these models in the beginning here, they were always based on an individual. And then had to sort of to, to, to change things to make them more representative of sort of the everyone or the general public or most of the case, case the average male, which we all know doesn't exist, right? Uh, in Japan, Toyota started developing the thumbs model. Um, and they were one of the first. So, so that, wa that was the sort of, I think, the first full human body model. It was launched in 2000. And then a little bit later came, uh, because these models were being developed in different places, and the automotive industry and researchers all around the world said, well, we should have the same model, uh, all of us, that we can work with. And that was sort of the driving force behind the Global Human Body Model Consortium, the GHBMC Consortium. Um, and they, they, from the beginning, when they were targeting and developing a family of models, the 5th, 50th, and 95th percentile females and males. But then we all know, I hope, what happened with the automotive industry economy in the 2000s, so things were going down, and they were able to survive, <coughs> but they focused on the average male. And now there are more. But in, the, in, the, in that, those 10 years. Uh, so there was a, a huge focus on the average male and several models of the average male. So in 2010, we developed at Chalmers <coughs> the first average female. Before that, there had only been average males and the small female, and she's really, really tiny. She's like a, a Swedish 12-year-old in size. So it doesn't really represent the, the female population. So to me, this, I think, is a big step. Um, that there's actually was a full body model of an average female also, and not only that we're sort of leaving the, the male norm safety development. Uh, the other thing that happened is that human body models went from being used as pure research tools by research universities or by research departments in the automotive um, companies to actually being used in product development at some of the automotive manufacturers. And I think that's a big step um, that happened. So they were being used not only to understand difficult questions, but also actually to optimize and develop systems used in the vehicles. And today, we are also seeing them coming into standardization and certifications. So we are seeing even body models being introduced in uh, in your ANCAP, for example. And there's a lot of work and discussion right now ongoing on how, how do we regulate this? What are the requirements that we pose on models that are to be used in certification? And on the models, if it's, for example, whiplash and seat design, how do we make sure that the virtual FE seat model is actually representative of the real seat model? So there's a lot of tricky uh, questions involved in human body models going into certifications. So that was the brief overview <laughs> so that you all sort of, I hope now a little bit founded in uh, or rooted in, um, uh, in the history of where all these models came from, of what's the background. So if we look 10, 15 years ago, um, there was a number of models available. Maybe I should even have changed this to 15, 20 years. Uh, but we had the thumbs model from Japan. We had the GM, General Motors model, which was from Saab Automo Automotive in Sweden, developed there. And you can see it was a combination of a dummy and a very detailed, I think still it's one of the most detailed uh, chest models. Uh, it was used to, to look to study aortic ruptures. Um, in, uh, which was a, an issue they had in, in, in crash simulations. And I'm not really sure what happened with this model when um, Saab went bankrupt. I think it exists in a researcher's pocket or in a hard drive somewhere in a city in northern Sweden. 
So if someone wants to use it, um, you can probably hunt him down and, and get the chest. <laughs> then we had the humus project that I talked about. You can see the way he's sitting. It's a little bit different from the others. Both the SAMS and the GHBMC models were made on sort of multimodal imaging systems. It was not from someone being frozen. It was from volunteers, live people being um, with medical imaging of different kinds, CTs and MRs and a combination of those. But they are, they're all made uh, from one individual that was picked very, very meticuli meticulously to represent the 50th percentile male, which is an individual that's 175 centimeters tall, about this height, and 78 kilos. And that's not what we look like, right? It doesn't really represent the full spread. And, we, and I think it's sort of a bit heritage from the crash dummies, where you can only manufacture so many versions. So then you have to go for, pick a few. But with human, modi mo human body models and, and the miracle models, there's actually not that limit. But still, researchers for a long time were stuck to the average male because they sort of wanted to compare to the 50th dummy. And, and here you see the normal distribution. Um, so Toyota also actually had the female. They had the fifth female for a pedestrian version only, not for the occupant, but for the pedestrian. And they also had a pedestrian six-year-old child. Um, and for kids, there was also an effort going on um, at the Doshisha University, probably not pronouncing it correctly, but uh, in Japan, where they took the male thumbs model and scaled it down to represent a three-year-old. And then su successively, they changed so that it represented more and more child structures and not just a miniature adult, which children are not. So that's the first really full, full human body model of a child that was used. And, about the, and, and that's open access. I know at least 10 years ago, we were able to access it at Chalmers. I'm not sure if that researcher is still at the university, but uh, if, if, you, if, if you search, maybe you could still find it. Uh, and at the same time in Europe, there was a project called CASPER going on uh, with the aim of developing a six-week-old, a six-month-old, one-year, three-year, and six-year-old human body models. Unfortunately, there were some proprietary issues, so all these models are decapitated, so not very useful. So how about today? We have a whole range, and I have not added Hans here. I look really forward to learning more about it today and put it into my slides. Um, we have, as you can see, we have an, the average female model from Chalmers that then, that's the first version, then went into an EU project called Virtual uh, and has been continually developed to both be an average female and an average male so that you can start doing studies on gender equality. We have the safer human body model, which from the beginning was a thumbs model that started to be modified, but now there are so many things changed and there's nothing left of the thumbs model. Uh, you have the Piper project, which was uh, the result of the CASPER project and the frustration from the researchers that they could not solve the proprietary issues. So when Piper was started, they decided we will go open source. Anyone who wants to join this project has to accept that all the results will be open source. So in the they made new heads for these child bodies from the CASPER project, and they are now available as the Piper child models. And then we have the GHBMC models. So I will be just really fast. Uh, thumbs, you can see you have a version of different models. Um, they also have an elderly and a pregnant female. And all these models were made available for free in January 2021. You cannot download the elderly occupant and the pregnant female. But if you contact them, I think you will be able to access them. And lots of different versions. And there's a European consortium of the original Thumbs users from the frustrations that developments and Im improvements were, were being done and was difficult to share. So we have the TUC project in, in, in Europe uh, where Thumbs users can share developments of these models. 
the GHBMC has now actually, they have also aged, obese, and models of combined, simplified, and detailed, anatomically detailed. Um, you have to license them through elements. It's essentially for free for academic use, but you have to sort of administer to the cost. But for commercial use, uh, there's a bigger fee. And they have now added the average female. It became available in December last year. So I'm really happy about that. There's now a second average female model. And and in the virtual project, they're actually using the average female model as the baseline that they do developments on. And then that model is morphed into the average male and into pedestrian and cyclist versions. So I think that's, that's a big uh, mind changer to have the full population. The safer HBM is an average male but they've worked a lot on morphability uh, and they're planning to release this model open source next year if all goes well uh, and then you will be able to morph it from a fifth female to a 95th male and everything in between and that's that's an example of the child model and it comes also with the open source pre-processing software where you can scale the child from one and a half to six years old and you can also position it. So that's, I have one, min one minute left, one minute, two minutes for questions. <laughs> okay, thank you, Karen. Um, actually, it was really uh, insightful also for me. Um, I didn't know that so many approaches on human body modeling. I just knew a few, like uh, GMBHs and uh, a thumbs model. Um, are there any questions from the audience? No? You're overwhelmed no. with <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But maybe I can ask someone. Um, yeah. I was wondering, um, you mentioned a couple of times this scaling approach, yeah. Yeah, like to get from a grown-up to a child, different yeah. ages. Are there any comparisons, how good they actually are, compared to like a take a child, scan it, create a model? So, so that's a good question. I'll, I'll give it as a cliffhanger for my second talk. Okay. <laughs> Right after lunch, I think, yeah, or, after, yeah, or okay. just before yeah. the afternoon coffee break, then I will talk about kids mm -hmm. versus adults and the models. Ah, okay, good. That's so one of the applications. Okay, so stay tuned then. Yeah. <laughs> to get the answer to the question. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Okay, there's one. Wait, yeah. wait. You get the microphone. Thanks for, for your nice presentation. What happened to the humus model, I'm wondering? I, I, it's been used by some universities in France, I know, um, because they some of the universities and organizations started doing more developments and improving it so that it became useful. So it's been used in research, and I think it's still used in research, but it's proprietary to the research groups that have done the improvements. Okay. So it's not accessible, but I still think it lives, especially in France. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, okay. Firstly, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm, I'm away from Marseille, University Gustav Eiffel. Yeah. Actually, our lab is still using humus model, yeah. but the problem is humus is developed in radios, so it's not in uh, anesthesia, so it's not so popular used. But uh, like since some model has been uh, open source, I think more and more uh, researchers are using uh, some model, especially on the air standard. That's why, uh, that's why Hume's model is not that popular for the moment yet. Yeah, yeah so but I think, yeah, so most of these, mo several of these models exist in both, in several codes, uh, both Dyna and Radios, and Radios is also very popular in France, which I think is why the Radios version of Humus is the one that's been improved, not the Alice Dyna version. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. One more, uh, one more question. For one more okay. question. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask how they determine this 50% average yeah. um, is in case of what properties, height, weight, um, or even uh, different structures or something like this. Uh, it's a very good question. And that's the reason why I don't think he exists because the average male it's based on measurements where you have the average mass of the head, the average height of the head, the average length of the arm, the average 
circumference of the arm, the, uh, of the legs, and so on. And, and everyone is not really proportional. So it's, it's put together by the averages of all the different body parts. And it's based on all old US data uh, from, I think, the 70s. Someone's not in good. <laughs> and it's, and the US, since then, the US population has, especially in mass, increased a lot. So the average male is not an average male in the US anymore, but it's actually very close to the global average today. So it's still irrelevant. So it's actually it's become more relevant, you could say, because it's gone from a North American average to a global average. Thank you very much. OK, um, there has been a question in the chat. Um, but I think to the schedule, we move on. And we try to answer the question in the chat. Then yeah, you can, you can keep it to my second presentation. Yeah, OK, good. OK, so the next speaker is actually my colleague, also partner of the ANSYS family, um, Alex Kromer. I don't know. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, the speaker, thank you. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> okay, we'll see Karen later again. Okay, so my co next, next speaker is my colleague, Alex. Uh, he's working for Dynamo, I don't know how m since how many years. I saw you on really, really early pictures from Dynamo. <laughs> so <laughs> he's working for a long time with Dynamo. And he's also focusing on human body modeling. And he actually will present um, the Hans, which is our new model. Um, I think it's brand new, it's fresh, really. It's um, almost production ready, I'm not sure. But um, Alex will give us an update on what's the status on this model. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Is that my work? Yep. Hey. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining our event here in Stuttgart. And thanks for tuning in on your screen at home or in your offices remotely. So, um, yeah, welcome from my end. Um, I'm Alex Gromer, and together with some colleagues, I'd like to present you our all-new human body model um, that we started to work on about a year ago. And yeah, basically, like after a sneak peek last fall, I guess this is maybe the first official high of hands. So, I think I first, I want to start with, with the name uh, Hans because I got asked this a lot. Um, you, you remember just the slides from Karen, like all these thumbs, GHBMC, Viva Plus, and everything. That's all acronyms. Like we, we decided um, to break with this scheme and just use the name Hans because we thought like we wanted to do a human body model and try to get as close as possible to a human. So I guess the first and easiest exercise is to give it a name. And we just thought, like, could have a regular name for a regular guy. And so this is Hans, something like John, for instance. All right, what's the agenda for today? Um, I want to start this presentation with just spending a few words on our motivation. Why are we doing this? What are our goals? with that we want to achieve with this model. Then, of course, the main part is be like, I want to talk about the model. I want to give you some insights, what we modeled, how we modeled these things, and yeah, what, what's the background behind this. Then robustness in the, in the human body simulation community is always an issue. So I want to address this in, the, in this presentation for our model uh, specifically. And thereafter, I want to just give a few words on performance and efficiency that we um, you know, thought of when, when building this model. And then usability, and in particular, the positioning, changing of the posture of the model is, is going to be a, a bigger topic here. And then I want to end this first part of the presentation with a use case example of a pedestrian load case. And a uh, summary and outlook will be given by my colleague Dirk today in the afternoon. All right, so what's our motivation here? So working at Dynamo, we typically see things always um, with you know, an automotive crash perspective. This is our home base. So and like here in this field, this is just one of the potential applications of a human body model. We see so many other potential applications, 
But this is basically the field where we want to start with, with our model. And luckily, like just these days, as we just heard again, like there's a lot of dynamics ongoing in, in this field. With, so within the next three, five years from now, we probably see a lot of virtual certification protocols coming up. Uh, in automotive crash, like for pedestrians or for occupant analysis. And um, yeah, we know Euro NCAP, IHS, China NCAP, these institutions are actively working on those protocols these days. And actually, we, we also are part of one of these, or actually, we're contributing to one of these projects in the Euro NCAP pedestrian load case. So yeah, there's the automotive market that we have in mind for, for this new model. So as these certifications are coming up in the near future, we, we believe there will be an increased usage at OEMs and main suppliers as well, as, you know, beside what's already going on these days. So they're like, don't get me wrong, we know there's a lot of human body simulations that OEMs do right now as we speak, but we, we believe this is going to be more in the future because of the certifications. Yeah, and this mainly in, in the occupant analysis for, and, and pedestrian safety on top of that. Besides that, we also think as we get some inquiries every now and then, um, there could be also a, a good, um, use for the model in terms of comfort and ergonomics, which is then like on the lower end of the impact energy that a model could experience. So we have that in mind as well. For consumer products, everyone who's doing some sports as a hobby knows the, the sport gear industry does a great job to make us buy a ton of gear even for simple things like just going running, yeah, what, what do you need? You just need shoes. But even this kind of stuff is getting more and more sophisticated and requires analysis. And as something like helmets, all kinds of body armor, shoes, like rackets, everything is in interaction with the human body model. So this is also a potential application where we, we see a market for, for this model. Of course, in that, like sports is everything is body external, so everything is outside the body. Um, but then when, when it comes to medical, there is also a big field of application for implants, for instance, or for patient-specific healthcare topics that then more focuses on the inside of the body. But it's also everything has interaction with the human body, so it, it, it is definitely uh, another market we want to look at. And then last but not least, defense. All right, so having said that, um, what are our goals now for this model? So I want to stress this here. This is only the goals for our first release. Like we have many things in mind, but our resources are limited, so we had to prioritize. Um, so the first, release of this model is going to be a passive model, which means no active model muscles are part of it. And it is targeted for any kind of impact simulation, like covering the range from a severe, fatal, like severe injury impact, all the way down to ideally comfort ergonomics range. So that's why we mainly focused on the musculoskeletal system of, of the human body. So we think the most critical thing here is a high biofidelity to, to ensure a, an accurate prediction of the kinematics. This is our priority number one here. So ultimately, everything comes down to injury prediction. But injury prediction can only be accurate if the kinematics is accurate. So if kinematics is accurate, you get the right loads into the joints, into the body regions, you get the right impact points on your surrounding, whatever, and that le finally leads you to hopefully the right injury prediction. 
So, and we think we can achieve this accurate kinematics um, through a extremely detailed geomet geometric resolution. And on top of that, we think if we, we, we model the parts as they are, that enables us to use materials as they are because we don't have to smear things. Like It's not like, hey, there is a skin, muscle, flesh, something, and we, we have a skin, a muscle, and a flesh part. It, it's, everything is individual. We have the materials individually, and we can use them as they are, and that leads towards like less tweaking in terms of correlating the, the model to a test. And also that, at least for my part, it should give us a better confidence to any kind of load cases that are not covered by pre-correlation work. Another thing we want to address with the model is we want to ensure best possible usability for, for our users. We know usability is always one of the big challenges when it comes to human body model thing. Um, we know this from our 16, 17 years now of experience with, with, with Thumbs model or distributing Thumbs model, supporting Thumbs model. So, <clears throat> yeah, we, we know this is always um, a challenge. It's not easy, like it's dummy, with dummies it's easier to position them because they have real joints, like the flesh is not con connected between the limbs, so it's, it's way easier to position such, such, such a model than, than our human body model. So we know about that. Uh, we, we also take this into consideration when we built this model, actually. Um, and we, we offer expert support, of course, and, and also we, we try to, to help with some pre- and post-processing tools, like you know a little helper that helps you to to create a positioning simulation or something that uh, helps you to evaluate injury data after an analysis. Then the second big hassle with when you deal with human body typically is, is robustness. So why is that? I mean, the problem is soft tissue is actually very soft. And like, especially when it comes to crashes, we have severe impacts, local impacts, and that typically can or that can and actually often does lead to negative volume element model crashes. I mean, you start a run, you hope to get a normal termination next day, but this is often not the case. Um, we are aware of that, and like we throw in all of our LS Dyna expertise knowledge to get the probability of having an unstable model as low as possible. This is also a challenge for us, but, um, and we, we, we've been through phases, Dirk and I, where we thought like, oh well, that's going to be tough, but like right now we, we definitely know it can work and we're convinced it will work. Yeah, of course, if something is wrong with the model, there will be a maintenance release. This goes without saying. Yeah, last but not least, there's the efficiency that we always have in mind. So we are aware this model is just a module of an even larger module. So just think of a car environment, the surrounding. There's a, a seat, there's a dashboard, there's particle airbags, multiple particle airbags. Like the whole surrounding, all the trims in a car, that's a lot. And like in an occupant analysis, you have all this. On top of that, you have your human body model. So we know this is just a smaller part of a larger model. So we should not be the bottleneck. We should make the, the, the model as, as efficient as possible. All right. Um, after these goals have been set, like, when it comes to model building, you typically start with the geometry. So what's the anatomy background of our model? It's 50% male, typically, as Karen already said. Um, yeah, um, 
I don't want to find an excuse for it. I think this is, this is definitely one of where everyone's kind of focusing on, on one hand, and on the other hand, when you want to, you have to get the geometry first, and it's not like you can shop. There's not too much data available out there, but we found a great, I mean, set of cat data, which has a, a really impressive quality with, with a, part, a company that we partnered with, Zygote. It's a US-based company, and their business is to create 3D data out of scans. Um, yeah, and we, we, we were able to acquire that data. Um, it's, it's based on MRI and CT scans of a single individual, and it's actually the individual is one out of five, so they scan five people and pick the one where they said like, okay, this has the least anomalies because every one of us has some anomalies in an organ or in some bone or whatever. So yeah, scans have been done in a recumbent position and then as you can see, this is a standing posture. So there have been some modifications applied to make this look more natural. Um, but other than that, everything is, is based um, on, on the data itself. Yeah, the, the body specs are 79 kilograms and 176 centimeters, which results in a BMI of 25.5, which is actually pretty close to what you just said is a 50% male average. Yeah. Like, what's probably not too average is the athlete's body shape that this guy is luckily having. Um, so, but this is where we started, and we active already thinking about um, getting a little bit like a more puffed up shape, like increase the body fat a little bit to make it look more regular. All right, now I wanna spend a few words on the model organization already. And if you're into model building, you, you would think like, hey, wait a second, you just skipped the big part. Like, what about the meshing? So I, I'm not talking too much about the meshing. I want to let the, the pictures and the animation speak by themselves. Um, so the meshing was actually a big challenge here. And we meshed part of them in-house, but the largest part has been meshed by a company nearby here, Cuba Engineering. So, um, they helped us a lot with the meshing, and you will see the outcome shortly and on the next slides. So we wanted to build the model a little bit more in a modular fashion, so, and then it's always, yeah, you gotta make a decision how you do it, you know, you do like something like a torso head, arm left, arm right thing, um, yeah. We spend a lot of thoughts on it, and we thought maybe it's the best to, to organize the model in layers, like, you know, and, and distinct the layers by their functionality and material properties. And that's why we came up with, yeah, just the five layers that you see here, that one. So we, got, we start with the uh, skeleton layer as, as the baseline layer, and then on top of on top of that, we will have the connective tissue, all the ligaments and capsules. Then there's the muscles. We have the inner organs and skin and adipose tissue as the fifth layer. So with the skeleton layer, I mean, this is basically the framework of our bodies. So it's the strongest material in, in like a bone is, is strongest part in a body and um, yeah we basically have all the bones meshed here as they are no simplifications that's how we started with and then like I guess almost everyone here knows like the bones are basically a, is a two layered or even three layered thing like the outer layer is a cortical bone which is the actual mechanically relevant part. This is where the stiffness is in the bone, and this is the, the load-bearing part of it. 
and the interior of the bone is filled with the trabecular bone, which is way softer and yeah, has, has a, or is less relevant for, for a mechanical or structural analysis. So the trabecular, uh, the cortical bone, like it's not a constant thickness, so it varies. Um, and actually, as this is the, the, the critical part here, you gotta, gotta make sure to resolve that as well. So luckily, the, the geometry data had this, da like this kind of data, so we know about the bone, cortical bone thicknesses, and we will have all the cortical bone thickness in those long tub tubular bones in the leg. So this is pretty accurate. We even have it discriticized with, with solids here. And then with some other parts, like the pelvic bone, the iliac wings, um, these have uh, a shell outer layer to represent the cortical bone and like the thickness, as you can see here, is fringed on it. Like, and then of course the ribs will, will also have uh, um, a variable uh, cortical bone thickness. As, yeah, for any kind of chest impact, this is definitely important to have. For any other bone in, in, the, in the skeleton, we use a constant thickness at, at this point. We may add more data to it once available, but we think for, you know, the, the, where the main focus is right now, I guess, like, this, this is sufficient data. So the next layer would be then the, the, the connective tissue, so mainly the ligaments and the, the joint capsules. So what is their function? Basically, they hold together the joints, like you can see here in this knee joint. So we got all the MCL, the ACLs, um, and, and, uh, and the capsule as well. Um, yeah, with this first release, I mean, this is the main connection in a joint. Anyone attending a worker class probably heard something from the instructor, like, you know, have your muscle, muscles engaged and active to support and protect your joints. Like, again, we're having a passive model at this point, so this is all we got. So, but it's all in there, it's modeled uh, with all the details that are available. Um, yeah, and this is for the, and then you can also see this as an example here with the, with the whole spine assembly. So they put all intervertebral discs and all the ligaments on, on those, um, on those vertebras to connect them each other. Because basically everything could be considered as a joint, any, any connection between two vertebras. So where do we get the, the data from here? So our material for the ligaments and the capsules um, is basically, uh, or is based on literature values at this point. We're using an octane-based nonlinear elastic material model here. It has rate dependency, um, yeah. And then we, we use some literature tests that are available to verify this on a component level test. Always feels awkward to use component when you talk about body parts. Um, but yeah, this is what I'm used for from, from my career so far. Um, yeah, and this is the uh, and lateral to medial knee bending test from Bose uh, out of 2014. So yeah, this is basically how we correlate those things. Well, that's the, then let's move on with, with the muscles. Um, this is basically like, the, for us, we think this is the most important part of the, the model at this point for two reasons. So first reason is we, we think the muscles play a key role in the kinematics. And second, they are the buffers for any kind of impacts. So we put a lot of effort into modeling these. And then, yeah, let's just have a look to the whole body. Like, you can see, like, we have every single muscle modeled. Everything is discriticized with 
uh, hexahedrons and pentahedrons. Um, yeah, it's actually a pretty impressive mesh. Took us a while. Yeah, we had to go through like a few revisions here and there, but actually not too many. So we're kind of happy with the outcome. Um, yeah. So yeah, and then regarding the material, we also use an octane-based material. Um, it also comes from, from literature, literature. I mean, that's what's available. It's incompressible, rate-dependent. We have an unloading definition. Um, yeah, this is what we use, and like so far, we can see like this is this is a good way of doing it. We're we're pretty happy with the outcome so far. Yeah, there's something special to the muscles. So a muscle is not just a muscle. It translates into a tendon at its end and connects finally to a bone. Um, and yeah, as you can see here with this example, like just our, like our bicep muscle here, like it tapers a lot in both ends if it would be exactly the same material throughout the, the whole part. Like if you act this muscle and engage it, nothing would happen other than you would stretch the ends because they're just so skinny. So, but what the body does basically, it, at the end, we're getting uh, tendons, and there's a transition between a muscle and a tendon. It's the myotendinous junction, which is basically, yeah, a, a transition zone. A tendon is like about 300 times stiffer than a muscle, so this is a large step up in stiffness. And I guess in an actual muscle, this transition is somehow fluent, it's different with each muscle. It's, yeah, it's, it's probably a smooth ramp up. Um, we don't have exactly that, but we, we, we kind of try to build a bridge between these two uh, extremes with, with this modeling, this myotendinous junction. And it basically had, has an average material stiffness between um, the, the tendon and, and the actual muscle. All right, moving on with the uh, internal organs. So we, all of the internal organs have been discriticized, so everything is there, everything is hopefully at the right spot. Um, yeah, but we don't spend too much of our attention to it at this point. Like, as I said earlier, we're focusing on the musculoskeletal system first. Um, right now, for us, the main the main purpose of these parts of the model would be they should provide the right mass and they should provide somewhat the right stack up in case of you, you know, we're looking at a torso compression or an abdominal compression. So um, we definitely will spend more time on refining the model at, at some later stage. We, we think these are important, but yeah, as I said, we have to prioritize at some point. So also the materials are literature-based, and some are um, derived from the muscle material. The heart is a muscle, so it's kind of natural to start with that here. Yeah, and maybe something to mention here with the muscle, uh, with with the heart and the abdominal artery. Here we actually have everything filled with with blood because of mass reasons again. Yeah. Okay, and then the last layer, the adipose tissue and the skin. So um, we, we use a two-layer approach, adipose tissue model with solid elements, and on top of that, there's a skin layer, just um, shell layer, a shell coat, basically. Yeah, and the skin is actually a pretty challenging uh, yeah, thing to do for us at this point. Um, there's many reasons for that, just to mention a few. So skin has a lot of different thicknesses. When we look at this here, this is basically looking at a cut section of the bottom 
of Hans. So yeah, we have very thick layers here, and then they transit into something really thin and skinny. Um, that's one thing, one challenge that we have to deal with. Another one is, um, yeah, the skin is not this, like, has not the same state everywhere in the model. Just looking at the knee example in a standing posture, on the back side of your knee, the, the skin is typically stretched. On the front side, it's not, it's slacked. And it would be the other way as you're in a seated position. So we have to somehow deal with that. Um, and another thing is, yeah, well, it's got to sustain a large motion range, large local deformation. Just, I guess, the most challenging um, area is around the, um, the shoulder. Yeah. As you can see in this picture, there's a lot to cover. And this is, yeah, this is another chance. So yeah, we're, we are working on it. Um, we're getting more and more confidence almost every day, figuring out new things. Um, yeah, confident to get it done um, until the release date. Yeah. All right, so as we like got a little insight about each of the layers, like what's the full model spec now. So at this point, we're looking at roughly 74 kgs, which is a little less than we're supposed to have. But mass validation is ongoing. And, and the reason what, what's kind of missing is, I mean, typically we have like seven to eight kilograms of blood in us. So that's not considered yet. So we got to smear this mass into the muscles or something. So we are aware of it. And like this is this is something we're going to do, uh, yeah, within the next days, weeks, yeah. Then, yeah, the height is kind of maintained. That's just a geometric thing. Um, yeah, model size, like we, we're talking about 1.7 million elements, 1.9 million, uh, sorry, 1.7 uh, million nodes, 1.9 million elements, um, and quite a large part, a number of parts, and this is due to the the muscle sectioning, basically modeling every, every muscle with three parts. Um, yeah, that adds up on, on the part numbers. Yeah. In total, I think we're just basically in the realm of the more detailed models, not that far above. But yeah, delivering this extra geometric resolution as a distinction to the, the, the other models in the pack. Yeah. Then, we actually are pretty proud that we can manage the whole model with just using one single contact. This is great for efficiency. Um, yeah, and works out well so far. And there's a couple of tight contacts for connecting things to each other. So it's, yeah. This is basically it uh, from, from model statistics. Yeah, and then moving on with robustness. So as you now got a flavor of the model, you would, might think, oh gosh, like the complexity is, is increased, but like we're already having issues with a simplified model. Um, so is this going to be a robust model? Uh, we, think, we think it definitely can be. Um, so, and this is, and, and actually from, from the meshing from the, of the first part, we, we, we think of robustness, we consider robustness with everything we do. As we know, this is a big deal. So, um, yeah, just talking, talking of meshing, like, um, so the best thing, or the, the yeah, one way to, to help with robustness is to have a mesh that has great shape, shaped elements. Like, I mean, if they're bad shaped elements, that's always a potential uh, problem or a pending problem during a, a simulation run. But as you know about the, the anatomy, it's a complicated and complex geometry. It's probably not possible to have great elements only. So we, we have to find a trade-off here. Um, and I just want to give you an example of, of a pretty simple looking muscle, the, the glute muscle, our biggest muscle. Um, it's yeah, it, it has something special because it tapers in all three directions. So you can see it tapering here. And I'm not sure if you, you can see it online and here in the audience. Like, 
we had to actually reduce a lot of number, like element rows, and you, you know, to kind of maintain the shape. Um, so that's not that. I mean, it would be easy if it's just one dimensional, but but with three, like tapering in all three directions, you you also see it uh, tapering up here and tapering over here. So it, that makes it more challenging. And and yeah, we tried to to create a a great foundation with the mesh um, to yeah, have, have um, the best possible element quality um, that, and that helps us a lot here with robustness. Then the material can contribute a part to create a more robust um, model and yeah, that's why we're doing a lot of Ololo testing. Here there's a tendon strap that gets pulled extremely. I haven't seen that in the model yet, but I've seen such a stretch in a muscle and the model didn't crash, which kind of um, made me proud as well because like, yeah, it, this is kind of the, the success stories we need to keep going and cre yeah, just create more confidence with it. Yeah, and then what we're doing overload tests or extreme load tests with localized loads like just you have a, a rigid impactor hitting the side of your upper leg. And yeah, I want to have a look at this. Like we're getting a severe compression here, but then you see the muscle recovers from that. There's no contact penetration. Um, yeah, it, it all like finds its initial place eventually. And then yeah, considering the fact that this was just a little bit shy of 14 kilonewtons, that's quite a lot for, for a local impact. So, and we, we do this in uh, multiple areas. And this is actually what we see here, our virtual dojo. Like all kinds of like really severe impacts on here. These four guys, this is all energy-based impacts, 45 kph just hitting like, like yeah, side, front, rear. Um, then we have a belt tension uh, test. Oops. That was a little bit a lot. But you see, it was not Hans crashing. <laughs> yeah, maybe it helps if I'm not using the pointer. And these guys are actually even more severe because that's just constant velocity. So we drive it, the impactor until the model crashes. So it's, it's not like it stops at some point. It's really like, yeah, it's, it's constant 30 kph, which is also an extremely severe load case. All right, yeah, then we have a few words on efficiency. Efficiency, as I said earlier, is also something important to us. So, so and a very like, powerful tuning knob in terms of efficiency is using a large time scale. So, as I said earlier, the model is a part of another model. And, and typically, I mean, we kind of know what these models look like. And for one global metric in a model is an explicit time integration would be the time step. And the time step actually is is one of those tuning knobs to make a model run faster. Um, it's been dictated by a couple of, you know, like element size, um, material laws, and, and such. But we know what, what the models typically have out there, and so we don't want to go below this time step. We don't want to be the human body, uh, the bottleneck and make our customers use a lower time step just because of it. So, um, yeah, we chose to go a larger time step. We had to accommodate for that in the mesh. Yeah, to make sure element, some, some element length are not, um, uh, uh, have a certain uh, edge length. So that's something we had to do here. Um, this is one thing. We, we do, then we'll try to keep the element count as low as possible. 
even though we want to resolve as much detail as possible. And we approach this by, do, like, yeah, by using individual uh, element edge lengths for uh, the, the different layers. So with bones, we basically have fracture in mind. And when, you, when it comes to fracture, we all know the smaller the elements are, the better it is. So that's why we chose a smaller element size here. Then coming to the soft tissues, that's basically deformation. But we don't think about you know, damage and failure at this point. So we, we increase the element size a little bit. And that, it's, yeah, it, this also helps a lot because like every little bit that you increase an element edge length in a three-dimensional part helps a lot because everything is to the power of three. Um, yeah, just think of a, a dice half or double the edge length is eight times less elements. So this helps a lot. And then when it comes to the skin, we're actually using even a little larger elements. So that helps us here. Yeah, we also like know about there are efficient more efficient materials, materials that have more features and are more sophisticated, take a little longer to compute. Um, so we, we, we pick the ones that we think is the best trade-off for, for us in terms of efficiency and accuracy. And then, yeah, also contacts is another thing. Well, just reducing the number of contacts in the first place helps a lot. And second, like, there is great features in the contact, but at, at some costs. And we carefully, um, you know, just consider what do we actually need and what can be neglected. Just to give you a ballpark number here, a typical impactor test or any kind of other impact analysis typically run these about 150 milliseconds. And the whole model runs like yeah, less than five hours on 48 cores on a not brand new, but also not really old computer type. So it, I, I guess we could, we could be pretty happy. And this is also comparable and even a bit faster what's out there in the market as we see it. Okay. Um, as you've now seen the whole muscle modeling and, and how the model looks, yeah, if, if you're doing human body simulation, you think like, how could you position this model? And yeah, this actually gave us a little headache too. So uh, yeah, we had to, we, we expected some hurdles along the way and we found them. So yeah, we had to, yeah, solve a few problems here. So when we position a model like this, and I have to say, this is an extreme position, positioning simulation because you typically don't go from an upright standing to a seated position. Typically, you do, like, there would be a seated position available and an upright standing. So you, you just adjust a little bit, but not go all the way. So, but we, we wanted to kind of figure out where, where the limits are, and we did this simulation. And maybe you already noticed, um, there's a lot of things happening in the model that don't look realistic and don't look nice at all. So yeah, the abdominal muscles are completely folded in a very non-realistic way. And yeah, this is totally not what we want to see here. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's a simple reason for that. Um, muscles are always acting in the tensile regime, which means the muscle is always more stretched or less stretched, but never really compressed. It, there's no press muscle. It's always the tension. Um, but what we are doing, we're having a pass passive model on the one hand, and then we guide the, the model into a position. So it's not an actuated motion. It's, it's a guided motion, a prescribed motion. So in, in this case, it actually can happen that a muscle experiences a compression. Just I want to give you another example, the calf muscle. Like if, yeah, if we just want to come from a standing into a seated position, have to do a knee bend here. As you can see it, 
in, in this animation and what's happening. Like the distance between the femur bone and the heel is actually shortening. So the muscle is not active, it doesn't do it. Um, it kind of deflects to the side and, and actually I think even worse is there's a lot of slack in the Achilles tendon. Yeah, so everyone here in the audience is, is seated right now. If you want to reach down and check on your Achilles tendon, it's probably pretty stretched. And if not, I know a good orthopedic. Um, yeah, so what, yeah, what can we do to resolve this? And we came up with an idea that we call macrofiber technology. Um, so, and this is basically adding fibers to the muscle. And as we don't want to add each single fiber, just a few fibers, each muscle, we call it macrofiber. And what does it do? We're basically adding those 1D hill type muscle elements that are available in Alastina for a long time already. And during a positioning run, we are basically monitoring the forces here, the cross-section forces in this muscle. And every time the forces drop into a compression, um, we would actuate those hill elements and you know, apply a stretch on it, which makes the muscle shrink in length. And then that, that leads to a um, tensile uh, force again in the muscle, so it doesn't deflect or bulge or whatever. It, it's basically just shortening. Um, and the good thing is it, it, it still keeps its volume because of the underlying material law with the volume constraint. So we're not losing or gaining any weight by positioning the, the model. And yeah, as we, as we do this, we just added these. And if you look at the calf now, it looks, it looks at, at least as I would have expected it. So the calf sits right where it's supposed to sit at the rear of the of the, um, or behind the, the shin and not a side of it. And also we have a nicely stretched Achilles tendon. And what works for this single muscle also works for the whole model. So we did this again here, added with all the concerning muscles that we found in this positioning run. We added this, you can see the blue cables inside the body here, um, and reran this simulation. Let's have a closer look to the abdominal muscle. And you see now it looks very nice and clean. There's no, no folding, no weird wrinkling. And, and this is what we kind of expected here. Yeah. So that was, that was uh, a great thing to us. We, we, we were really happy we could get there. The good thing is this can be incorporated into the model, so it's not a user issue. So it's just there. Like, you do your positioning run as you are. All you have to do is basically add and include. Um, and like the model takes care of the rest of it. Yeah. Then I want to give you just one more example because I, I think this is very impressive. Um, so it's about a, a lower arm movement that is pretty, pretty simple to every one of us. We're doing it probably 100 times a day or like if you think of a tennis player switching between backhand and forehand all the time, so it's basically this turning into this, 180 degree turn. So what happens kinematically um, at a closer look, um, the radius actually, like this orange bone, rotates around the ulna. And yeah, we don't have any joints in the model. It's just everything is modeled on contact and through the muscles. And again, I have to say, this is a quite extreme uh, motion. So we'll have this model here. Mike, there's your bone. See it? And then we rotate it. And this just happens like it's supposed to be. And like we were, I mean, it just out of the box. We didn't do anything to it other than just modeling the parts, which was, again, another thing when, when doing this project, yeah. And then let's add the muscles on top of this, doing it again. Like we're actually having those, um, those MFTs in the model already. And then 
Oh man, that was the coolest one. So maybe I can show it this way. So even the skin follows nicely without any extreme distortions, um, which I think is quite impressive. <laughs> okay, yeah, so on my last slide, to close this, this presentation for now, I just want to give you an example of, of a use case, and we picked one of these upcoming TB24 load cases, the pedestrian load cases. So first thing we had to do is position it with, yeah, it's just the way we do, shake in the head here. Um, Actually, we saw, yeah, a lot of funny things happening in his face during load cases. We might come up with a, a little video on that one as well. Um, yeah, and once we're done with positioning, yeah, we're going to the analysis and have those runs. And yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive to see what's going on inside the body. Well, yeah, with that, I'd like to close it. For now, do we have time for any questions? Um, yeah, maybe just a few time for questions. First of all, thank you, Alex, uh, for the insight. It um, was pretty interesting to see how you actually build up a model from scratch. And um, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, first just ask on site, are there any questions here? Someone, comments? Okay, Michael, wait. You explained what you do to do with the muscles when you shorten them. What do you do with the uh, ligaments? Um, at this point, we're not doing anything. So they are buckling. They might buckle. Some, some we've seen slight buckling, but not extensively. Like when when looking at a knee bend or so, it's mostly like the tendons we see a lot, like almost curling, because there's much more to shorten. With with the tendons, we haven't observed it that much, but Essentially, we could do exactly the same thing there. And the, tendons are also, the, the tendons are also not shortening, it's all compensated no, by the no. muscles. The whole shortening happens in, in the, the actual muscle, muscle yeah. because of the stiffness difference, there's not much happening in the tendon. Okay, thanks. Okay, one more, maybe a quick one from the online audience. Um, you mentioned um, the blood flow, or the blood at least. So mm -hmm. right now, there is no blood at all, right? You're going to just Yeah, a little bit. Mass. In, oh. in the heart, the heart is filled. Yeah. And the main artery is filled. It, is there some blood flow going on, or it's just nope. some part? It's just a mass, actually. Yeah, it's in like, a, like a water-like material law mm -hmm. in LSD. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, thanks, Alex, again. Yeah. Okay, um, there's a couple of open questions online, and we'll answer them later in the chat. Um, but so for the people online, um, we're going to miss anything. Okay, next speaker is uh, YY. Um, Will my colleague take over? He basically uh, did his PhD in Marseille, if I remember correctly, five years ago. And now he's a researcher at the Gustav Eisel University. And he's talking a little bit about neck injuries or basically how to prevent them, what you can do about this um, in um, cart overrolling. Can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. So my, my name is Wei Wei. First name and the family name is the same, it's quite simple. Uh, I'm a research engineer from the laboratory of applied biomechanics in Marseille, France, which is a, a joint research institute of ex Marseille University and uh, University Gust uh, Gustave Eiffel. So today I would like to share with you our study on neck injuries and the protection efficacy of uh, neck braces in cutting rollover accident. Let's firstly watch a video to know a little bit about cutting rollovers. Cutting rollover is not uncommon in cutting racing, and it's usually uh, initiated uh, by a first collision with another go-cut go or another obstacle that results in uh, head-to-ground impacts and usually leads to neck injuries. In cutting racing, the drivers must wear a helmet and sometimes a neck brace 
to protect from neck injuries in the, uh, in, in, uh, in the collisions or in this kind of uh, accident. However, it's un uncertain whether a uh, neck brace really does a good job in this kind of accident, I mean, cutting roll, uh, roll, roll overs or not. That's why we try to answer this question in our study. To study the impact loading to, uh, to the neck, firstly, we tried to develop a multi-body model of a go-kart and then fit uh, a multi-body model of a hybrid three dummy on the cart. For a uh, model calibration purpose, we tried to use this model to reconstruct several realistic cutting rollover roll accidents, and then used the multi-body model to simulate the six typical crash scenarios, like, uh, like here, case one, case two, case four, three, five, and eight, with different initial accident conditions, I mean, uh, different uh, uh, mass of the cut, different initial velocities, different impact angles, et cetera, to uh, study the impact, the impact conditions of the head to ground during cutting rollovers. For the limited time, I won't adjust the details with uh, multiple simulation here, but we need to know that we divided the helmet into different regions like I listed here from one to 12, so as to study the head to ground impact conditions relative to each helmet region. And with this kind of information, it will be easier for us to simulate head to ground impact just using an impact hit in the head relative to each helmet region. And in the study, we found that for helmet zone one, two, three, and four was the most frequently impacted, impacted cases in cutting rollovers. We got the impacted, uh, impact velocity for tangential component, normal component, and also impact angle Z and X, which are the uh, Z-axis of the uh, the axis of the head and x axis of, of the head relative to the normal direction of the ground. As I said before, uh, with this kind of uh, data, we can simulate just uh, by using impact uh, hit the head. Otherwise, we will have to, uh, to apply, an, uh, apply an, uh, an initial velocity to the whole model and to hit the ground. Then with this, Data, we tried to simulate lateral head, head impact with PMHS, PMHS tests to characterize the head and neck kinematics and also the sustained injuries. We typically uh, simulated impact to helmet zone A and B corresponding to zone one and two in the multiple day simulations. We, uh, we had three three actual accelerometers on the helmet to measure the angular velocity during the impact. We also had one three actual accelerometer in the mouth on the sternum and, on, and also on T1 to measure the corresponding accelerations as well. After each, uh, each impact, we had autopsy and CT scan to examine soft tissue injuries and also uh, bone fractures. Here are the videos for uh, PMHS test one, two, and three. For the subject one, we had C7 laminar fracture, C4, C5 articular uh, facet fracture, as well as a rupture of the posterior ligaments at C1, C2, and C2, C3 uh, segments. For subject two, we only had C3 laminar fractures without any soft tissue injury. And for subject three, we had no visible Soft, uh, soft tissue injury or bone fractures. Then we try to simulate the first test, I mean PMHS uh, one with some V5 occupant model and uh, try to uh, compare the simulation results and with the physical test. To do so, we uh, used a some V5 occupant model. We positioned it on a simplified seat under the gravity and then uh, constrained the body with three belts as we did in the physical test, and then fit a motorcycle helmet to the head and simulate the impact to the corresponding helmet region. 
So first, we uh, try to position the Samsung Ultimate model on a simplified seat consisting, consisting of just two flat rigid surfaces under, under the gravity. To keep the general posture, we use the keyboard to deformable to rigid for all, the, for, the, for all the skeleton components. Then, uh, we, at the second step, we uh, constrain the body with three uh, fabric strip, just with a prescribed motion of pulling. Then, the mod, uh, again, to keep the general posture, we constrain the rotational degree of freedom for the head and neck components. We still kept the keyboard deformable to rigid for all the skeleton uh, components. And then, uh, during this simulation, we, we also initiated, uh, we also inherited the initial stress and deformation with the keyboard initial form reference geometry for all the soft tissue and flesh. And then, we fit the helmet we fit the helmet model to the head and applied an initial velocity of 5.0 meter per second with a stroke distance and hit the corresponding uh, region on the helmet. So uh, the uh, to position the impact, we just, uh, we referred to the position in the video at the first impact between the impactor and the helmet to position the impact in the simulation. To compare the physical test and the simulation, we compared the impact time of the impactor to the helmet, the impact force, and also the head lateral rotation. The head lateral rotation we measured by uh, different nodes on the helmet and uh, captured the motion with the, the, the markers on the helmet in the physical test video. So head lateral rotation is quite close between the simulation and the physical test, but the impact in the simulation is shorter and with a higher impact force compared to the physical test, which could be due to the fact that the impact, the impact in the simulation, the impact in the uh, physical test it was not perfectly uh, guided, so could move upward and downward during the impact and result into uh, a longer contact compared to the simulation. Some other factors could also contribute to the difference as well. For example, the, uh, in the PMHS test, the subject was an old female with a smaller size compared to a Samsung V5 Arcan model, which is a middle size. The helmet model in the simulation was not exactly the same as the helmet we used in the test as well. If we check the stress level on the vertebra, we could still predict uh, peak stress on the C5 left facet, uh, which corresponds to, uh, I would say, the uh, C4, C5 facet fracture in the physical test. But we couldn't predict the uh, ligament ruptures according to the strain level on the, in the model. Then we try to compare the intervertebral rotation for each functional spinal unit in the simulation against the, the injury threshold for uh, range of motion in literature, we predicted injuries at the level C0, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, and C7, T1, which were kind of close to uh, the injuries that we observed in the PMHS test. In other words, it might be a good way to uh, just to compare the functional spinal unit range of motion to the injury threshold in literature when we use some sort of occupant model to simulate head impact so as to uh, predict neck, neck injuries and efficacy of the neck braces. That's why in the following study, we just used occupant V5 subsystem model to simulate head impact and to evaluate the efficacy of the neck braces. Just to recap uh, the impact conditions for head and neck that we uh, measured in multiple simulation, we found that impact zone one, two, three, four was the most frequently impacted uh, cases, accounting for 98%. Uh, 
with the Samsung V5 Ocean model that we used to reconstruct PMHS test one, we uh, fit different neck braces on the model and simulated these four uh, impact, head impact. Neck brace one and two are motorcycle version. Neck braces three, four, and five were the cutting version, I mean, for cutting racing drivers. In Samsung V5 Ocean model, there are three muscle status relaxed muscle, breast muscle with activation, and also muscle without activation to decide which muscle status we, that we should use in the head impact simulations. We just started with the impact, the impact to helmet zone two uh, by using these three muscle status. We compared the impact force of the helmet, neck loadings at different cross sections, and the functional spinal unit range of motion among the three simulations with different muscle status. So for the impact force, I mean, the, the impact to helmet impact force, uh, the, the results are almost identical among the three simulations with different muscle status. The neck loadings for the three simulations were also quite close. But if we check the intervertebral rotation for each functional spinal unit, the uh, intervertebral rotation from the simulation without muscle activation was different from the, the other two simulations with uh, relaxed muscles or with uh, braced muscles. The other two simulations are quite identical, I mean, in terms of the intervertebral rotations. And if we compare the range of motion against the injury thresholds, which are the dashed lines in this plot, this plot we, we found that the simulations without muscle status might have more functional spinal units with excessive range of motion. So, mean, so, so indicating a possible higher injury risk for the neck. So to summarize, we found little difference in terms of uh, uh, helmet impact force, neck loadings for the simulation with the three different muscle status. The uh, little difference was, uh, was found either for the intervertebral rotation for relaxed or braced muscles. The simulation without muscle activation might have, a, might have more spinal innates with excessive range of motion, so meaning uh, a possible higher neck injury risk. But ho however, using just sleeping status, I mean, without muscle status, in cutting racing is not so realistic. That's why in, in the following simulation, simulations, we only considered relaxed muscle status to simulate a different head impact on the helmet regions. So for helmet impact zone one, we had a normal velocity 1.37 meter per second with a tangential velocity 7.56. Some uh, the videos with different devices from the front view and from lateral view. Firstly, we measured the neck loadings in terms of uh, compression force and shear force at C1, C5, and T1 cross section. We found that the compression force was always much lower than the injury threshold which is 3,600 Newton. So probably, probably uh, say it's not likely to have compression-related injury regardless of the neck braces either. But if we check the uh, intervertebral loadings in terms of flexion moment or lateral bending moment, the flexion moment was quite close to the injury thresholds, 39 and uh, 80.6 Newton meter for the upper and the uh, lower necks. So indicating possible to have flexion related injuries despite the neck braces it, uh, as well. And it's not obvious to, to identify which neck brace has the best performance in terms of the reduction in, uh, in neck loadings because sometimes with a neck brace, the loading at C1 might be, for example, might be higher, but at C5 or T1 might be lower. And then again, 
we uh, captured the intervertebral rotation for, different, for each functional unit, C0, C1, C1, C2, for different directions as well, flexion extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation. We compared the range of motion with the injury thresholds, which are also the dashed light on, uh, on this plot. We counted the, fric uh, the, the frequency of each func functional, functional spinal unit, uh, which have a higher range of motion than the injury thresholds, and use this as a measure to evaluate the efficacy of different devices. So here are C2, C3, C3, C4, C4, C5, C, C5, C6, and C6, C7. And in this table, we listed the functional spinal unit, which have a higher range of motion than the, than the injury thresholds for different devices and for, different, for the three rotational direction. We found that uh, all the, with, all, with, with, with the neck braces, the, uh, the frequency of a functional spinal unit will be lower than the simulation without a neck brace. So means the neck injury risk could be a little bit lower than the simulation without a neck brace. And the device two has the best performance, but only for the impact to helmet region uh, one. Then for impact zone two, we had a normal velocity 3.58 meters per second. The simulations with different devices from front view, from lateral view. Similarly, we first measured the neck loadings in terms of compression force and the shear force. The compression force was always much lower. Here is only a half of the injury thresholds. So indicating not likely to have a compression related injury. For the flexion uh, components, uh, despite the neck braces, the flexion moments were much higher for upper neck and also for lower neck. So indicating likely to have flexion related injuries. But again, it's, it's not obvious which device have has a better performance in, in, in terms of the reduction in neck loadings. So similarly, we again captured the, the intervertebral rotation for different devices and for different, uh, uh, for, the, for the three rotational direction compared with the injury thresholds as the, uh, in the plot, the dashed lines. We counted Again, the, fre the frequency for each functional spinal unit having a, having a higher range of motion than the injury thresholds. Here, we found that even with, uh, ne with neck braces, the frequency is just a little bit lower. Without a neck brace, the frequency is eight, but with, with neck braces, the frequency is still six or seven. So the the performance is quite limited compared to the impact zone one. And for helmet impact zone three, we had a normal impact velocity 4.0 or 10 meter per second. Again, the simulation for different devices from front view and lateral view. Similarly, we again compared the compression force but still, the compression force is always lower than the injury threshold, indicating not likely to have compression-related injury. Flexion moments were always much, much higher than the injury thresholds, especially for lower necks at C5 and T1. And again, in, uh, intervertebral rotation, compared to injury thresholds for each functional spinal unit and for each neck brace. We always counted the friction, uh, the frequency for each functional spinal unit having excessive uh, range of motion. Here we found that all the, uh, the simulations with the neck brace always had a, a lower 
frequency is except for UIS4, which, uh, which is a little bit higher than the simulation without a neck brace. And for impact zone four, we had a normal velocity 3.92 meters per second. The simulation from uh, lateral view and frontal view, we always compared the uh, neck loadings in terms of compression force, shear force against the injury thresholds. The compression force was always much lower. And the flexion moments were always much higher than the injury thresholds in literature uh, 39 and uh, 80.6 for the upper and the lower necks, so indicating likely to have flexion related injuries. But as we always ob uh, observed for other helmet regions, it's not evident to identify the best uh, neck, neck braces in terms of the reduction in uh, neck loadings. And finally, again, we always compare the range of motion for each functional spinal unit. And the frequency uh, for each functional spinal unit with excessive range of motion. For helmet zone, uh, zone four, we found that device three had a higher frequency with functional spinal unit, excessive range of motion. And to summarize, we listed all the functional spinal unit which, which had excessive range of motion compared to injury thresholds for each device and for uh, the three different rotational direction. We counted the frequency for each device and for each direction as a measure to evaluate the, uh, the efficacy of, of the neck braces. We found that in general, the uh, neck braces performed better in helmet zone one, then followed by helmet zone four, and then followed by uh, helmet zone two and three. Helmet zone one is on this region with a tangential velocity posterior, so basically more, uh, mainly in extension motion. Then helmet four basically mainly in uh, flexion, flexion motion, Helmet zone three and four are on the lateral side, mainly with lateral bending motion. In helmet zone three, with the device four, there are more functional spanning units with excessive range of motion. And in helmet zone four, device three had more functional unit uh, with excessive range of motion. It's always not obvious uh, to identify the most effective neck braces in terms of reduction in neck loadings or uh, the frequency with the function spinal units with excessive range of motion. I mean, uh, I mean for, we, are, we, were not, we, are, we were not sure whether the motor version or the cut version neck braces are better for uh, cutting racing or not. And to conclude the efficacy of the neck braces, in terms of uh, full neck loadings, the neck braces do not always reduce neck loadings. No significant difference was observed uh, in terms of the neck loading with or without a neck brace. It's not straightforward to identify the most effective neck braces either. In terms of range of motion, in general, the neck braces perform better in helmet zone one, basically mainly in extension motion followed by uh, helmet zone four, mainly in flexion uh, motion, and then zone two and three, mainly in lateral bending motion. It's, not, uh, it's uncertain whether the motorcycle version or the cut version devices are better for cutting racing or not. So it will be really necessary to optimize the design of neck braces, especially against the neck lateral bending for cutting racing in future studies. And this, this is all for my, for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Bai. OK, um, again, a few questions. A little bit behind the schedule, but if there are some questions, I think Wei is happy to answer right now. 
No, but I have one. Um, yep. You talked about the uh, muscle activation level in your model, if you yep. have the relaxed muscle and the w activated one. Do you have any measuring data about the activation level? So how much activated is activated? So like tension level in your muscles? I can imagine like in anticipating a crash or something, you have higher tension than on a no, I basic. No, I, I didn't really uh, check the activation level in the something model. I just used the, the, uh, the d default mm. uh, settings in the model. Mm. And yeah, okay. so I didn't check uh, really the okay. muscle activation levels. Okay, so you also don't have any like real world measurements yeah. of the activation we don't have. It's, mm -hmm. You just use the model, okay. Yeah. Okay, I think, uh, due to lack of time, I think we move on to the next speaker, and it's Patrick, uh, Patrick Lerke. Um, he's, <laughs> he was studying, uh, I think, uh, what's called in English, I think medical engineering, I guess. First did a bachelor in uh, Hagen, then moved to Stuttgart, his master, and now he's a PhD student at the University of Stuttgart. And the institute is, uh, what is modeling and simulation of biomechanics systems. And he, uh, wait, let me just prepare the talk for him. Which one was it? This one here? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, with that being said, I think. Yeah. Okay, Patrick. So. Does this work? Yeah. Oh. Oh. I'll do it this way. I'll put it on. Thank you. Ah. Wait, but Patrick? Mm -hmm. Presenter. Okay, so the stage is yours. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, just for your information, I'm here in place of Mr. Sun Schmidt, who is currently busy um, in Munich solving a murder case um, in court with an active human body model. So, well, I thank you very much for the invitation and for the chance to give this talk. Um, as you can see, the topic of my talk is more or less all about muscles and muscle material, um, and yeah, a very special muscle material um, in particular. Just one or two words about, about us. Well, we are the Institute for Modeling and Simulation of Biomechanical Systems. Um, we are located here at the University of Stuttgart, here in Feingen, Feingen campus, so pretty nearby, luckily, so it was pretty, or just a short walk for today's talk. Another information for you um, in the beginning, just to clarify something up, maybe as well, where all our, or some of our expectations are coming from. Um, well, we as institute or as group, because the institute is existing since 2019 only. Um, we have a pretty huge background in modeling muscle-driven systems, but mainly um, in form of simulating multi-body systems since the 1990s, something like this. And since 2016, we started transferring our well, knowledge, our expectations, and our research um, into the finite element world as well. Um, this goes so far that, at least for the multi-body simulation environment, we have not just um, this knowledge or a few models, but we have our own simulation tool and our own scaling tool as well. So we have a scaler for multi-body systems. Um, what makes it, to a certain point, pretty easy to uh, transfer muscles or models from the one, env uh, one environment to another, just uh, for example, you have the thumbs model. The results I want to present you today are mainly um, produced uh, with the thumbs versions 3, 4, and 5, and the Viva OpenHBM. Um, so a few of the other models we already heard about uh, were in that case not taken into account. But yeah, that's our state. Then for the general overview and yeah, motivation, what drives us to implement muscles in general into finite element models, and why is making uh, finite element models active from our perspective so important? Well, at least you've already heard um, that muscles are the actuators that drive us into position, that allow us to move, and also uh, makes able to hold a certain position. 
So muscle contraction is the tool of choice, not any other external string, marionette uh, method, something like this. Um, additionally, muscle contraction um, is responsible and having an influence on the stiffness properties of the human body. So if a muscle contracts, it gets stiffer and therefore affecting the whole stiffness of the body. So by co-contraction, I can theoretically change my body stiffness by holding the same pose, theoretically, through muscular activation. Um, at the same time, the models we used and we uh, heard about are well mostly validated with post-mortem human subjects. I think what we all know, what we can agree on, is that post-mortem human subjects are not able to react on any kind of event, uh, not even reactively, um, as a human being would do, because it is, by definition, um, a passive entity. And therefore, in reality, we still see a difference in the results between the infield data and the data that was previously um, used for the validation case. And then, yeah, what I, to a certain point, already said, muscles, therefore, as active units, allow us to react and to predict to certain events and are therefore also of an interest because it's not just a preparation they are able to do or they make us do, but it's also some kind of reaction. For example, if we have, uh, have something like a braking maneuver, if we stay in this automotive context, or something like lane change maneuver. And something that's pretty similar to what we already uh, heard of, the layered definition for the thumbs. Well, from our perspective, there is um, a comparable understanding of how we can structure and how we can divide the human body. We, at this point, assume that um, we can divide the human body into the control system, mostly passive, so we have the bones as supporting and structural material. We have the passive elements, um, so yeah, ligaments, we have fats, we have tendons, etc. And then we have the active units, so the ones we are actually working on. So we have the muscles uh, that are contracting and are creating force via contraction. And we have our neurons uh, that are at, um, at the end responsible for something like the delay, so the time that's necessary from the point we build up some kind of motion intention to the point where this intention ends up in the muscle and leads to muscle contraction. And as I said in the beginning, I want to focus today on the lower half and the lower half only because uh, we didn't do any, any bigger modification on the model side, um, but we implemented or replaced muscles to uh, make them more biophidetic or at least to reproduce a specific be uh, behavior um, we intended. Then, a bit more into detail. I talked and uh, told you with the title that I want to talk about an extended hill type muscle material in this finite element world. Well, there is already, uh, already a muscle material given in Alastina and in the thumb smalls uh, in particular. Um, it is the mud muscle. But we came to a point, or well, um, my colleagues came to a point uh, that the definition of the hill muscle as we know it, especially the hill uh, three element model, uh, is not really sophisticating because it misses something. It misses, uh, it misses a dampening characteristic that's um, produced in the tendon element. And therefore, we created uh, a new material, a user-defined material, we call the extended hill type material, because this extended hill type material not just has uh, the contractile element and the parallel elastic element in the muscle, but the serial elastic, as, uh, elastic element, which is classic, and a new serial dampening element, which is changing the muscle characteristic to a point 
um, I want to show you in the upcoming slides. Um, this implementation into Elastina happened just after all this previous research work in 2017 and was done by a former PhD student at another institute of the University of Stuttgart uh, at the Institute of Technical Me Me Mechanics and therefore by Christian Kleinbach. Um, but since then, there were still a few modifications done on this material up to another publication uh, just submitted this year by Alexander Martinenko, which was again a um, cooperative work between these two institutes of the University of Stuttgart. One or two words in detail, so Elastina. Uh, environment, what is the extended hill type muscle material? Because what we already heard about was um, the modeling approach with the three dimensional muscle model, or well, the muscle as solid element. Um, with the background of uh, multi body systems or multi body dynamics, we assume mostly um, that it's, uh, we take this simplification um, and we use beam elements. So it's one dimensional in that case. And uh, the beam elements in that uh, case replace, depending on the question, not just the muscle element or the mud muscle, but in case that we have a mud muscle, probably uh, in a serial and a serial modeling approach with a tendon unit or then a beam, which is uh, with a slip ring or what is it? Uh, it's mud seat belt, I think, that modeled. Um, we replace this by one element only. So it's even from the modeling perspective, um, a simpler case, um, because at the same time, we don't need any load curve. All the calculations about uh, the fourth length properties or fourth length uh, or force velocity, uh, force velocity relations are done internally. Um, at the same time, it's nearly 10 times faster and it has also a higher uh, numerical robustness than the currently available mud muscle. Um, the routing is possible as well, and is again, a bit into detail, that case done with part average. So the question, um, which part of the muscle is a tendon, which part of the, uh, of the element is the muscle belly, is more or less uh, done and defined automatically internally by the calculation. The material for you, because um, it's user-defined material, is um, publicly available if you're interested to do your own research with this material. It's available uh, via our, uh, our Daurus network. Um, and there you can find the extended hill type muscle material and the manual as well. So if there are any questions to it, feel free to contact us. But if you want to start on your own, this would be the address for you. Then, something from the start, I told you uh, that we have not just this muscle material and our own simulation environment, but at the same time, we have a scaling environment. And since the material is cross-platform um, available, we are able to transfer models on the one side, but we are also able to transfer control parameters or muscle behavior from uh, one environment to another. Because the material as it is has a few controller functionalities already implemented. So, well, this was a pretty long introduction. Now I want to go a bit more into detail. Um, I told you about accomplishments. Well, the accomplishments I want to talk about are these four, at least. We have, um, the first one is, well, more or less just about the passive material. Then we have two um, that are addressing the controller functionality. And then we have a third one that's addressing the uh, injury behavior or the available to calculate injuries with this material. Well, 
as I said, um, the first part is what is this material changing in the model? Or how is it changing the model uh, behavior? Um, something we found out just by replacing the material here in a thumbs version 5 was that in the same load case, the model behavior, so breaking load case, um, was closer to what we got with the experiments. So we already had an increased Cora rating just by replacing the material. Without any kind of, of um, activation, just with the new material. But then I want to go, uh, go a bit more into muscle activation because uh, the passive muscle element alone would be a bit boring probably. And so I want to start about controls. And again, how do we see muscle or muscle control and, mus uh, and movement uh, in a skeleton? Well, we have this basic understanding of muscles working as elementary biological drive. What we mean with elementary biological drive is that in case we ha uh, have a degree of freedom defined by a mechanical joint, we have at least two muscles acting here as um, agonist and as antagonist, where we can achieve both motion directions by the different muscles acting on, uh, and contracting in such a way that it ends up as torque um, on the joint, which is creating a form of motion and is leading to a fixed position here. Um, this can then again split it up into two different parts because on the one side we expect at least the open loop activation, so the signal coming from our brain uh, telling the muscle, well, contract to a certain point, so stimulation signal, at, but at the same time the muscle itself um, has this feedback loop because of the internal sensors we see here. So it gets a local feedback information. Well, what, uh, what uh, is my current muscle length? Uh, what is the expected muscle length? And so I'm controlling and stabilizing at a certain position. This, again, is the part that's responsible for um, what I called co-contraction. Because with this open stimulation functionality in the first place, we are able uh, not just to move and just uh, define what is the muscle length we need to reach a specific position if one muscle is contracting, uh, but we're also able to contract muscles on both sides without any, uh, any kinematic effects. So we end up here with these then hybrid functionality, where we have theoretically three possible control approaches, all given in the material. The one is the open loop approach, so just give the muscle um, a stimulation signal, which is producing force and torque. Um, we have this feedback functionality, which is defined by the muscle length, but just the length of the contractile unit, this is the so-called lambda controller. And then we have the hybrid control, uh, controller, which is a combination of both of them. And um, in a Kistemacher use case, so well, just elbow flexion use case, we tested all three of them to reach uh, experimental data and ended up with the conclusion that, well, the hybrid controller, at least in that case, performed the best. Another functionality given with the muscle material next to the feed forward activation is the reflex activation. This is based on research work done by a colleague, Isabel Wochner, um, which was looking at the so-called falling hats experience. So uh, she had different subjects. They were placed um, on, on a table. And then at a certain point, the stabilizing part was then flipped away. They had to fall down. 
and we analyzed how the human neck is behaving as a result um, of this missing support. And here again, we modify the controller in such a point that uh, the controller was now able to create, because of a local feedback loop in the spinal cord, um, a force as a result of a certain muscle strain level. And with this muscle strain um, functionality, it wasn't any longer necessary uh, for in every case uh, to tell from our motor cortex uh, that the muscle need to reach a specific level, but here it rea uh, reacts automatically and it is, as we see it, a way faster than anything else that would came from our uh, central uh, neural system. And again, this reflex functionality allowed us with the model to react closer to the natural or a mean behavior of the real subjects than any passive, or in this case, the passive viva model would do. Passive viva model is somewhere on the lower end, while the green one is pretty close to the mean. If there are any questions um, to you or on the graphs, feel free to contact me later and uh, we'll still talk about it. And then the fourth chapter is about a new injury or well, injury calculation. Because um, what we know is that in our soft tissues, for example, there are different kinds of, of ruptures, for example, that are um, pretty well documented with post-mortem human subjects again. But with these passive elements, a colleague of mine did some research um, where he made the chance of an injury dependent on the muscle force. So how far is a muscle contracting? What's the muscle stiffness? And how far is this uh, changing uh, or defining the injury risk? So that we were now able for the active model with our extended hill type material, predict isolated uh, the chance for, uh, for a muscle rupture. And we validated this, the colleague validated this, uh, in a load case where it took a rotating seat, rotating 30 degrees to the inside from an outside, outside position. Assuming that, for example, in one of these visions of uh, new mobility, you are probably seated the other way around, and then in case of a crash, the car is turning again into the, well, standard position with the result that a lot of the uh, basic parameters weren't, for this criterion, not accurate or not accurate enough. So we got a lot of results for, for injuries. So uh, we had to modify the muscle, uh, muscle materials. So it was, uh, to a certain point, some kind of validation case as well, because we knew from other experience that there were no injuries with these parameters or with these muscles in real active units. But these are mainly the accomplishments. So let me talk now a bit more on the challenges we faced with the available um, finite element human body models, because still we were mostly uh, working with full body models or then with body, body part models. And well, first difficulty here, or the first challenge, was the muscle validation. Because for the muscle validation, it's very fundamental for us to know what is the muscle influence on a specific joint. The muscle influence is defined by the torque, because there is, uh, at a specific point, at least one point where uh, you have a, a certain level the muscle is creating force via contraction, and at this level, the force is then producing a torque at the joint, uh, joint center. 
So we validate our muscles um, with the information about uh, the leather arm or then torque behavior over a flexion, but well, with no information about uh, the joint or a joint rotation point, it was pretty difficult or it is pretty difficult and time consuming uh, to approximate um, a certain joint position or a joint angle, uh, especially for something like the hip here, um, when you want and need to define probably geometrically one theoretical joint rotation point for the pen and then another one for the femur head as well. Because it's not always guaranteed that uh, these are identical or at least are matching. So, well, it's just best guess and not always uh, yeah, an ideal solution, what we came up with. Then another thing is the muscle deflection. Because we know that the muscle, or the muscle as we see it as one dimensional joint, is in the end the path of action in this three dimensional medium. Um, but the path of action can change as a result of motion that's happening in the joint. For example, in the knee, um, because at a certain point there's no real obstacle because of joints or fats, and then the further you flex your knee, um, the deflection changes to the middle of your, your femur. And we want to model this changing leather arm behavior with arm muscles as well. And we, we, uh, we already did this or found at least one solution um, in our multibody system, um, which was created and defined by Maria Hammer. So this tailoring approach where she modeled different ellipses. These are, um, to be honest with you, more or less just the outer geometries of a muscle. So if we can combine the muscle geometry from a three-dimensional uh, perspective to the theoretical and possible path of action, I think this could be, could be really great. So the approach we currently use with this fixed wire point deflection, where the deflection is defined just by one point that's moving with the related surface is still usable, but just suitable for really small kinematic approaches. And then with thumb small at least, there are also a few additional ones um, addressing the joint stability. Because with our expectations um, coming from uh, multi-body dynamics and the multi-body system, we mostly assume, well, there needs to be some kind of joint position or joint angle. This is defined in uh, every time step. We apply a muscle, it has this torque influence, and um, it's not really changing because multi-body systems work with rigid body models. When we apply our muscles to deformable finite element models, at least the ones that are shown here and that are deformable, we see in some cases, just because of muscular contraction, some kind of model deformation. So an example on the run right side, you see the shoulder collapsing because of the contracting muscles. The effect is that there is no real effect, no kinematic effect, because the muscle is shortening. We have, for example, our control parameters that are length dependent but there's no motion produced at the joint because we have this off, uh, offset defined by the deformation of the model. Something similar here in the hip. So you can see that in, I think it's Thumbs version four, um, if you see the model as it's there by default, the model um, has some kind of gap. So if we start contracting our muscles, the first thing that happens is that the femur head is moving into the hip pan because from the initial time step, there's no real contact. And same here, um, we have a muscle contraction with no kinematic effect. 
Then a second thing, uh, this is the robustness against the formation. Because, well, sometimes it's then a, well, at least pretty uh, good go-to method to say that uh, you want not just to move a model into a certain position with the muscles, because there are a few uh, step stones, a few, few obstacles coming there, um, but to move it with a repositioning software with beams or something externally, and then start uh, with something like the equilibrium point hypothesis. So we just say that, okay, now I want to simulate a certain scenario, for example, uh, again, safety rated um, with a specific, uh, specific position by just holding this position and applying the muscle forces that are necessary from theory um, to hold this position. But then we see on the same side, well, uh, it's not really possible to reach position as you think or thought because um, the segments, again, are deformating just like the elbows here. So we want to bring the hands into a certain position, somewhere to a steering wheel or something like this, and see that the elbow is elongated. It has, again, an influence, for example, on the muscle strain injury predictions, because if we would pull then, or previously, on something like a steering wheel, we would assume that mostly the hands are uh, affected, but then we see, well, the elbows are affected as well, which doesn't match what we see in reality. And then just a few minor ones in addition, um, mobility of a model, something we also heard about, um, is a very, very good topic because here as well, um, from our experiences, we saw that some models may be limited to a certain point in their mobility, because uh, here we found out that the asymmetry, for example, at the femur and tibia condyles uh, was not really matching what we, what we saw in literature. At the same time, uh, the folding behavior of a model, also something you already heard about, um, can be in, well, a few applied cases somehow pretty critical uh, because sometimes it's creating numerical instabilities. And therefore, um, we would somehow insist to take something like a pre-stress, uh, especially in the passive elements, so the ligaments and the tendons into account so that when you move the body or a joint into both directions, you don't see these deformations because if you assume some kind of pre-stress, well, it was, would then lower the stress level but ended up um, in a straight result. And the last thing of these additional challenges um, was or is the passive stiffness of a model we see. Because again, if we apply forces um, or torques in the end to certain joints, we expect some kind of, of motion. Um, in multibody, there's not always uh, a stiffness, stiffness defined, should be best case. But here, with um, biofidelic muscles, so with a force level that is comparable to a real human muscle force behavior, uh, we already see some kind of deformation, which is so huge that it can cause, uh, again, some kind of of injury, theoretically. And therefore, uh, we are forced to work with something like a go-to uh, go method, uh, which is, in that case, switching between, the rich, uh, between a rigid, rigid body uh, model, or then rigid material, and deformable models uh, for the time of motion or deformation. Well then, well, the conclusion. It, it sounds probably a bit like a small rent, but please don't see it that way. I'm really, really, really looking forward and happy to see the improvements, especially the improvements done with the new, new Thumbs model, because I think uh, a lot of these challenges are presented here are to a certain point addressed with the new developments in the new model. At the same time, we have this material that's giving us additional chances in making the model 
reacting more powerful delicately because we are able to react to certain scenarios, but we are also able to do something like a predictive motion or to realize something like an intended motion. And therefore, finally, I'm really looking forward to new updates and to new improvements in especially the new Hans model. Are there any questions from your side? Okay. Um, thank, you. thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah. Are there questions from the audience on site? No comments? Okay. Um, I may have one. Um, you sure. mentioned a couple of um, human body models. Um, mm -hmm. There was the Viva Open and the Thumbs, if I remember. Uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, Open Viva and three different Thumbs versions. Yeah. So, so, so what was the reason to choose different models? Was there some kind of, uh, is it just a question of availability? Is it based on the model itself? So is there something missing in one model? Why you go with the other one? Or what was the reason? Uh, it's, it's both to a certain point because, um, as you know, the Thumbs version 5, for example, is already modeled with muscles. So it was uh, pretty easy to use this model, which is already prepared for, for a muscle simulation, and then just replace the existing material and uh, do some benchmark tests and validations with our material, just as I, as I showed. Um, and then, well, for example, a switch from version 3 to version 4 was necessary because for a few load cases or scenarios where you wanted to use this model, um, the mesh quality of version 3 was not really sophisticating to us. Okay. And there's the, there was an online question, but it's also the same question I have and probably all, everyone else. Um, are there any collaborations with the Hans uh, bringing muscle activation into Hans? <laughs> Dirk, Hans? <laughs> we'll see. I think. We'll see. Okay, good. So I think this goes out to the, the online guy who was asking this one. Okay, um, so for the moment, um, we are done here now. We have a break now. We have the lunch break. And we have it till 1.13. 115, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, wherever you're intending, I mean, this goes to the online audience. Um, it's 15 minutes after the one, uh, the complete hour, and we will be back in 45 minutes to 50 minutes from now on. Okay? So, everyone, food will be served in the next room. So, just around the next room, we'll find the food, and then see you in a couple of minutes back after lunch break. Okay? Okay, um, thank you everyone. So, I hope you enjoyed the break. Um, also, people online, hope you enjoyed the break. Um, we move on with our uh, agenda. And the next talk is given by Oka Dafci. And actually, he's a former colleague of mine. We shared uh, our time at the University of Stuttgart. He used to be working for Dinado, which is an ANSYS company now. <laughs> but uh, before the acquisition, he actually changed to the Fraunhofer Institute, IPA, in uh, Stuttgart. And he's mainly working on uh, uh, muscle tissue, right? Uh, modeling of muscle tissue, and yeah, with that being said, Okan, it's your turn. Thank you, Mike, for the kind introduction. Welcome to everybody. Um, um, and thank you that I can present the, our work in my re, uh, research group in silica orthopedics, which I established in the department biomechatronic systems at the Fraunhofer Institute. I will talk today about biomechanical in silico human modeling of the musculoskeletal system uh, applied to orthopedics and engineering of uh, biomechanical engineering of products. Some of the products is uh, seen here, and this is the leg model, which is the content for today. So I will start my topic um, with. Uh, introducing the, or looking on the biomechanical performance of implants, especially the, the total knee replacement uh, implants. If you're looking now um, to the statistic, we will, we will have an increase of total knee replacement, about 33% in Germany until 2050, which is a um, great increase, but higher grow in the first revision of implants. It's the implant failure under the age of 65. It will increase about 100% in male and 41% in female. And these statistics, these numbers, is much higher, significantly higher in US. And if you now looking on the probability of failure or probability of revision, which shows this diagram, um, it is, the orange curve is the age under 55 years. It is twice higher 
than all the patients than, older than 64. Um, this is the years when the failure happens. And what we can say here, that probably there's many, many issues why, why that happens, that younger people get, has, has more uh, probability of failure. Um, I think the, the, the younger people are more mobile, they are currently in work, they are continuing their hobbies, they are more active. And that brings us to the uh, conclusion that the performance of implants with regard, regard to the patient's biomechanics is probably insufficient in the implants or not existing. And if you're looking now why that, that probably happens that the implants are not adjusted patient specifically, is that the most implants or all implants are tested with isonorms or ESME norms. There's some of the norms are shown here. There's many more. And these norms tests are very important because they need for the certification of the implants. And, and uh, the implants has to fulfill the minimum, required, uh, uh, minimum requirements, uh, shape stability, deformation stability, or long time behavior. But these tests has nothing to do with the realistic human load conditions. They're not representing the physiological biomechanical environment as well. The cadaver test is not realistic because the deaf tissue, the, uh, the mechanics are completely different. And also these structures are not um, representing the joint stiffness, which is defined by ligaments, all the structures, connective tissue, muscle, muscle pre-stretches. It's more complex. And also the kinematic of, of, of the joint is very specific and individual. Um, this is like a fingerprint. And these are um, act, you know, um, driven by muscle forces. And these all can also not represent by, by these tests. Now we can say that the, the current procedure um, cannot represent or optimize or evaluate implants on patient-specific individual biomechanics. And, and this um, uh, um, causes the one, one thing that the European Union tightened the medical device regulation for all products. That means that all products should be now clinical, bring a clinical evidence that works really good for the patient. And that causes as well enormous problems for the companies. And this is an interview with more than 100 um, companies in Southwest Germany, close to here. All of them say that these new regulation, tightening the regulations, brings the difficulties or um, problems in innovation of products. They, the costs of certifi new certification or certification product processes increase the cost enormously. Some of the current products are, um, are taken away from the market because they are not beneficial. Um, R&D activities are reduced and many, many problems. What is now the solution for that in the, of the companies? They put, they put a lot of workforces into the clinical evidence studies and certification process, but this is a short-term solution. What is the long-term solution for this problem? Probably it is the in silico medicine um, for orthopedic applications. This, is, this shows our process. We are um, developing um, since several years our in silico physiologic biomechanical human modeling platform, which consists as well the experimental side, the biomechanical joint analysis, musculoskeletal analysis, as, as well medical imaging processes, MRI, diffusion MRI, ultrasound, and to create such models, leg models, for example, with that, with different joints. Um, and these developments is always also integrated in the frame of a verification validation process, as well with the quantification of the uncertainties. We cannot verify models, 
completely or the validated models completely because it's very complex. The human is not easy uh, to simulate. As well, the experiments are difficult. And our idea is to use these models in analysis of surgical intervention, for example, uh, correction of foot deformities. This is um, for drop foot, uh, stroke patients, or cerebral palsy um, with tendon lengthening or other interventions, what the surgeons are doing. Also integrating of implants into the model, which shows the right sketch. Um, it could be knee, hip, or ankle implants, and create as well a um, virtual cohort of human or patients to carry out uh, clean, virtual clinical studies. Um, so we can support as well in a, um, the clinical approval process of implants uh, with, you know, with, the, with, the, with the goal, bring more safety for patients, bring more safety for the surgeons, uh, and for the manufacturer or producer. Now I will um, go to some topics of our uh, platform, what we are developing, human modeling platform, to biomechanics and tissue modeling. This is our motion, uh, motion capture lab, um, where we do different kind of experiments, analyzes the joint forces, joint kinematics, um, as well the muscle activation for different tasks uh, uh, to know how the isometric uh, force contractions are or, or in cycling using high density MMGs uh, for measuring the muscle activation or with collaboration with the University of Heidelberg and Uni Stuttgart, we measure as well with electrostimulation of, of the muscle, individual muscles to see the forces of the individual muscle, which is important. We do that in different angle of the ankle joint. That's joint dependent for force generation which is also important is the, the structure of the muscle, which is depending on the collagen content, which change also the stiffness of the muscle. In this um, sketch, we see different kind of muscles. This is rectus femoris, semius membranosus, tibius anterior, and the other one, longus uh, gracilis. Um, we see that the collagen content is different for all muscles and is also varying from proximal to the middle of the muscle and to the distal end of the muscle. This is very important information to create developing um, gradient-based stiffness change in muscle to tendon. Uh, the, the left picture shows our um, own uh, developed segmentation processes using MRI image data we're using for our segmentation deformorphic mapping, which is um, very accurate if you compare it to the manual segmentation. And uh, we can create such a segmentation process of the complete leg within a few days. Um, that's work patient, specific, patient specifically very good. And we have all the fiber orientations of the muscle. Um, we developed a um, thermal base or Laplace equation based uh, determination of the fiber orientations and validated with the diffusion MRIs um, uh, to a, um, fiber trajectory segmentation and we get a really good results and such um, numerical determination of fiber orientation can be done in a few hours for the complete leg. That's easy, you can automate this process very well. And uh, the next point, we use also ultrasound. Ultrasound measuring is very accurate and you can use that all for dynamic measuring. You can bring some loads on the surface. You see the deformation of the individual muscles and the fibers. And you can use uh, inverse modeling to approximate the material parameters of the individual muscles to the measured data. And this gives us some good idea for the um, patient's um, 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 tissue data. And this is uh, a brief animation about, from our leg model that shows the different group of, of, the, muscle, of the muscles which are uh, mainly doing a specific task like dorsal flexion, uh, abduction, adduction of the hip or flexion extension, however. The, and uh, we have all the connective tissues, ligaments and uh, retina columns and, and so on. 
And uh, on the left side, we see this is our implemented muscle tendon model. Um, uh, we implemented uh, that in, in Elastina Usamat. It consists of uh, three parts. We have an isotropic part, which is the exoskeletal matrix. Um, uh, we use a monorivalin formulation from Crisfield. And we have a fiber um, formulation for the passive and as well for the active part. Both of them are nonlinear formulations. The active part has an ascending and descending part for the fourth generation. And we have also the collagen distribution, which changed the stiffness from muscle belly to, to the tendon as well to the aponeurosis, or from the aponeurosis to the, to, the, to the muscle. And this is a simple example. This is the tibialis anterior muscle. Uh, the fiber orientation, we see the fiber orientation and the internal aponeurosis, which is a kind of tendon and the tendons at the end. Um, we have the collagen distribution uh, to the tendon. This, you know, that's now a gradient. We have not the jump in the stiffness, which is very important for the numerical point. We have also the aponeurosis inside. They have also some gradient to the muscle. So that's everything smooth. We can see a contraction of the fibers uh, for the simple case and see that compared to the next, next uh, image, we have no necking problems. If you have a tendon muscle jump in the stiffness, you, you get, get such necking problems because you have high deformations in the muscle. Now the, the next um, example, uh, what I want to present is the pre-stretch optimization, which I developed for the elbow joint, which is used as well for the other joints too. And uh, the pre-stretch of the muscle is very important. This is, this is the measure how much active force you can generate in the muscle. And it defines as well the stiffness of the joint. And, and this is the arm model. Uh, we, it consists of five muscles. We, we have uh, biceps, brachialis, brachiradialis. These are the flexors, or uh, triceps, and anuncius. These are the, uh, these are the, the uh, extensors. And the fiber orientations can be seen here on the right side. And we have also the aponeurosis of the um, triceps. And <clears throat> the arm position, what we have is some are in a flex position. This is the initial position uh, of the arm. And we have to, in this position that if you activate it, uh, you will always get, um, should activate the triceps for extension or uh, for the flexion, the, the flexor muscles. You cannot you not use the gravitation force. If you have the arm position in that case, if you go to extension, you never uh, activate the triceps. This is, um, you use the gravitation force to come down with the, with the arm. And the optimization criterion for the pre-stretch based on the range of motion, what you have. Uh, if you are in the neutral position, you go to extension, you have a minus 10 degrees from the neutral position and 140 degrees to complex flexion. And we use the flexion extension ratio for the optimization criterion. That that um, the flexion extension are balanced in a good way that the muscle works efficiently. And we, from this image, this is our initial position, we have some amount of, fle uh, of flexion and extension. We use this criterion to optimizing or balancing the pre-stretches in a good way. You see here on the left, this is a global sensitivity analysis. The blue bars are um, the effect of the pre-stretches to extension. And the triceps, which is also activated, has the most influence to the extension, which is obviously. And we have biceps and brachialis, which has also, the pre-stretch parameters has also effect on that. Why? They give some uh, passive stiffness to the joint. The triceps should be uh, generate more force because if you go to the extension, the, the flexors are extant in a way. And if you're looking to the green bars, this is the flexion movement where the flexors, biceps brachialis are very important or has the most influence and brachiradialis um, less. This is the long muscle here. 
the, it has for this position less effectivity because it's, the arm is already in some, somehow in a flex position. If you go to the other position, this uh, brachyradialis will flex and then it will get also more dominant. And if you now looking on the meta surfaces, this is a top view of the response surfaces, the blue curve are the optimal solution path which fulfills the criterion uh, of flexion and ratio, flexion extension ratio. And that it shows that biceps and brachialis, the, if you follow this curve, you see that at some level, the brachialis, if that increase, the biceps should be decreased. They're negatively correlated to each other in order to be in an optimal solution path that to fulfill the, real, um, the ratio of flexion extension. And if you look the, uh, the the triceps with the flexors, you have a positive correlation. If you increase the pre-stretch of the biceps, you have to increase the, tri uh, the, uh, the pre-stretch as well from the tri um, triceps in order to be in the optimal solution path. You see that that the pre-stretch are correlated to antagonist and agonist. And this is the initial shape um, after in a, in a, the, the fiber stretch or green strain after initialization of the, of the fiber stretch and that in the extension flexion position. Now, if you, uh, if you have the optimal pre-stretch distribution, then you can go to arbitrary simulation activation patterns, for example, to fulfill the complete range of motion. This is um, now, uh, um, yeah, the activation the, of the flexors and the triceps to, to, uh, of the complete range of motion. Now, the, um, the next uh, numerical example is the muscular simulation of the, or analysis of the muscular dysfunction of the ankle foot joint. This is the model what we have, uh, eight muscles. In the muscles, we have also the ligaments, the tendons, individual, the Achilles tendon, aponeurosis, which combines um, the soleus and the gastus gemeus, um, and um, the retina columns. Um, and this is uh, from the uh, bottom view of the structure of the tendons. If you go to the next slide, is the medial and lateral view of, of, of the structure that we have. These, um, so these structures um, are very important to keep the tendons in the position. Otherwise, if you activated the muscle, it will stretch. Uh, sorry. Ah. So um, now the ankle foot joint um, is um, very complex. The most people use a single, single uh, rotation axis, which is not physiological because the ankle foot joint has two two joints, the uh, talocral joint and the subtalar joint, which are not fixed in space. They change also the rotation if, the, if you move your foot. This is um, highly uh, um, complex. It's uh, still a um, point of research in, in, in orthopedics. It's not well, uh, absolutely well understood. And we, we have to go to the physiological joint if we want to help surgeons in their decision-making of correction of surgeons or interventions. Uh, we cannot put any constraints into the joint, otherwise we make some errors and, and, and uh, falsify the simulation results. Um, for the first step, we took only this joint, we, um, the articulated surfaces, we modeled that very smoothly. We have uh, all the, the cartilage and ligaments in for, for that, and we are pulling on the tendons and see if you can reach the complete range of motion. That means the plantar flexion, inversion, eversion, supination, and pronation for, for of the foot. And we see is the, some are blockings of the bones, uh, is the forces that we are pulling on that represents the realistic motion of the, of the foot. And if you, if you are satisfied with that mo motion, we can go to the next step with the complete uh, shank model. First, you have again optimized the pre-stretches of the ankle joint. This is a complex, now more complex um, 
optimization process because we have more degree of freedom as the elbow joint. And if you did that, then we can put the gravitation and arbitrary forward dynamic analysis on that foot. We are now activating here the flexors and extensors somehow that we have, we get the plantar, plantar flexion, dorsal flexion of the foot. We see the fiber orientations or change of the fibers um, in, in the specific movement. We see also the stretches of the aponeurosis, the Achilles tendon, all the, the individual ligaments and the cartilages as well. So um, if you um, um, fix that for the healthy person, then we can analyze the parameters, how much effect they have. We reduce the pre-stretches somehow, which is shown here, and we see now the reduction of the dorsal flexion about 50%, and less reduction, about 30%, in plantar flexion. That we see that the pre-stretch in the musculoskeletal system has an enormous effect on the motion and the kinematics. And this um, kind of pre-stretch is correlated probably also to, to stroke patients, which has a drop foot, and um, they have the similar conditions. And the next uh, point is um, what if we make the passive st or increase the passive st stiffness of the, of the muscles. And we see an enormous drop or increase the passive stiffness, enormous drop of the dorsal flexion movement, and, uh, but less reduction of the plantar flexion. This is correlated to cerebral palsy patients, which has more collagen content of the dorsal flexion muscles that are very stiff. They cannot lift the foot up. And, and then, yeah, this shows that um, we can go into more realistic simulation of muscular disease or muscular disease of the of joint function. The next um, point is the transformal lip analysis of the hip joint. Uh, this is the complex model um, from the anterior and posterior view with all muscles which is responsible for the hip motions. And we have also the muscles which are cut because of the amputation. They, these muscles are fixed together. Uh, we say, they said to that a myodesis uh, technique of operation, and they support as well the end of the femur, which is cut with the muscles, and they fix the muscle at, on, the, on the bone with some pre-stretch. If you're not putting some pre-stretch, you, your limb will go to adduction in some flexion, which is no more effective if you want to activate the, the muscles to come to flexion. So the surgeons have to decide how much they stretch the muscle and prepare the limb in a way that the, that the limb works efficiently afterwards because they have to work with the prosthesis together. And on the right side, we see again the complete fiber orientations. We covered that with fat and muscle, uh, fat and skin uh, for prosthesis simulation. Now, this is now um, um, the, the forward dynamic analysis. First, again, we have optimized the pre-stretches of each muscle and tendons, and then we can go to arbitrary kinematics, which can be also measured from the patients, or a kinematic, which is wished from the surgeon. And we can see how effective the muscles works to, um, for, for these kinematics. This is, that shows the extension flexion, and abduction adduction is a circle, somehow a circle movement of the limb. And, and, and other kinematics, what we have is the blue, um, the red opt with the optimized pre-stretch, and the blue and the green are a reduced pre-stretch of 50% and 33 to 33%. We see um, how much the kinematics change if you change the pre-stretch conditions. It's very, uh, uh, sensitive to that as well. Now, if you, um, if you go a step further, if you can optimize the surgical technique for, for the amputation, you can put a prosthesis on the stump 
and try to lift up the, the socket. And such a socket is not like a shoe. It's, um, it's personal optimized uh, to the biomechanics of the limb and for the comfort of, of, the, of, of the limb. Then we can see how much force is necessary to lift the prosthetic up and correct as well the socket design that works efficiently. And we can also show the stress distribution in the limb and optimize the design of the socket um, for, to, to comfort criterion, which is given here. Um, in some areas, you have to put, bring pressure on it because it should be stable, the socket on the, on the limb. In some areas, you cannot put any stresses because there's a scarf or there's um, nerves, which cause a huge pain. So, um, and this is very individual. From, from patient to patient, it's different. And we developed a virtual designing of the socket with op uh, optimized to biomechan for bi biomechanical motion and comfort. And the last example is the knee joint modeling. Um, <clears throat> the, we are currently working on that. Um, and as well, we have no any constraints in the joints. We, all the, we have all the connective tissues, ACL, PCL, meniscus, cartilages, and so on. And then we activated the flexors and see the motion here, and which is very interesting is that the motion is not straight. You know, they make some S-curve. This S-curve depends on all structures, on, as well on the pre-stretches of the muscles and activation patterns. So it is um, um, high as a sophisticated optimization process to get realistic kinematic data from, uh, from the knee flexion. And if you change, for example, um, ACL reconstruction, you can see as well the change of the kinematics of that intervention. So that's my conclusion. We are not the same. We are not uh, minions. And our idea is how we come to personalize individual patient models to create virtual cohort of patients um, that we have may maybe 500 or more virtual patients instead of 50 and bring more um, traceability knowledge to, to um, um, surgery, decision making and implant testing. Thank you for your attention and yeah. Okay, um, thank you, Okan. Also here again, uh, we can a little bit behind the schedule. Um, are there any questions? Okay, I have one. Um, I was just wondering what kind of, ah, there was one? Ah, wait. Thank you very much at first. Um, I wanted to ask what kind of elements did you use for the simulation and how was it modeled in detail for the elements? Um, hexagon elements are used, which is in, uh, also um, recommended in Elastina. And um, for, the, uh, for the shank model, for example, we have um, 800,000 elements. 800,000 elements. Okay. <coughs> Another question? Okay, I have a quick one. Um, did you do it implicit or explicit? It's all implicit simulations. Okay. Did, did you have any problems, contact issues, or hack conversions? Uh, can you just <laughs> <laughs> okay? <it's> a... <laughs> How robust? Uh... No, it's uh, it's robust. I say the segmentation process is not the the most time-consuming part. You know, you can segment uh, segmentation that in few days you have the leg model, but the most developing time is to get efficient finite element model. That that's, takes the time, somehow years to come to good models, but if you did that once, you know for the next one what you have to do. That's that's a good thing, and um, the initiation of the pre-stretch and dorsal plantar flexion movement with the activation takes one and a half hour. Okay. So, okay. Cool. Okay. So I think then we stop here. We move on to the next speaker again. So thank you again, Okan. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, the next speaker again is uh, again Karen. <laughs>
<laughs> the same one we had in the morning. Um, now she will give a second talk. And we're going to need a short break. We need to switch to computers. Can you hear me? Yeah. I just need to find the presentation. Yeah, it, it, would, it did find two. Yeah, okay, we have it. Okay. Oh, it, it's on the right screen. Perfect. <clears throat> um, so I got the freedom to talk about diverse applications, which essentially is anything. So I, I've... I've okay. <laughs> so I, I've, um, I've picked a little bit different. I've worked a lot with muscle modeling, but I have not included any muscle modeling, which I'm a little bit happy because there's been so much muscle modeling already said. And I must say it's a very impressive work in the last presentation. Um, so I will uh, talk a little bit about the GHBMC model. I got some update slides yesterday um, on the status of that model and the project and show you a few applications done by Elements in North America. Um, then I'll show you a little bit work that we've done at Lightness together with um, um, a helmet or airbag helmet manufacturer called Hubding. Um, on, and, and then I thought I'd focus a little bit on the injury predictability, which has not been talked so much about. What, I mean, what do we do with the output of these models that we get? What's, how do we go from stresses and strains or kinematics to, to um, uh, interpret that in terms of injuries? In people. And I'll present shortly the safer HBM also and a few applications done by Volvo Cars and Autolib Research. Um, and then to the child question. Uh, <laughs> so I thought um, I'd add a little bit on the differences between adults and children, which everyone working in traffic safety should know. So I took this as an opportunity to benchmark that. So I'm really grateful you had that question. Um, and then um, a very recent project that I did together with a, an a insurance company in Sweden was to evaluate equestrian riding vests that are supposed to protect against chest injuries um, for, for horse riders, where I used the Viva Plus models, the latest version. So to start off with the GHBMC um, update, so, the, the, like I mentioned this morning, the, I, at least to me, the most important thing that's happened is actually the development of the average female. So now there's a small female, there's an average female, an average male, and a large male. Um, and they come up, and they come both in detailed models. Um, with all the internal organs and injury prediction for all the organs, and which means it's really heavy to run uh, computationally wise, which means it's impractical to use, which is then not used by the automotive industry uh, because it takes too long. So there's, there was a pressure um, on the GHB and consortium saying we need simplified models. So therefore they developed the simplified models also. And you can see all the internal organs are lumped, a lot of the kinematic joints 
um, which you've heard a lot about how the joints work for both the Hans presentation and the last presentation. Uh, they've been exchanged for mechanical kinematic joints uh, to speed up runtime. So if you're interested mostly in kinematics and to some extent um, uh, stresses and strains of, of bones, for example, then the, the simplified models are there, and then you have the detailed models for complexity. And this is, I would say, is sort of similar for the thumbs models also. They started off being a little bit more simplified, and then they created a really detailed version, but very few people used it because it took so long runtime. So then they continued development with the first version. So that's why the version numbering of the thumbs models is a bit, little bit confusing. So six is after four and five is different and so on. And then you can see they, they also have the pedestrian models. And then they have also, <clears throat> uh, it, it's not only, we don't only have the gender issue, we also have an age issue in traffic safety. Um, where elderly occupants or older occupants, they don't even have to be elderly. Um, somewhere my age, it starts to really drop in tolerances uh, and strength. Uh, so, and it's not only the material properties that change, because that we could easily tweak, right, in a material card. Everyone knows <laughs> you can just sh change the number, but also things change in the body shape. And in the skeleton, like the angle of the rib cage, um, and and you know we shrink a little bit, and um, and so that needs to be implemented also. So <clears throat> they develop age targeted models. I show you that, um, and then we have, like I mentioned through the question on the average male, that it's no longer the average for the American population. So in North America, obesity is a huge problem. So. Uh, Models of obese are also being developed. So the reason they actually went for the, what the average female, even though it was not in their plan, was uh, because of a um, politician in the US who raised the issue. So I think at some point there's been enough um, lobbying done of lots of people around the world trying to raise the issue that we need to have models in traffic safety that also represent females and not only males. Um, so that was a requirement and it was funded by, the, by NHTSA, the Road Traffic Ad Administration in the US. And I learned uh, this morning, it's, it's been distributed since December 2022, so it's now available. And here you have the aged. So you can get aged versions of the small female and the average male. Um, and they have targeted the anthropometries and morphed. So this is the morphing process going from the M50 or this or the F05 uh, to anthropometrics, to stochastical anthropometric geometries of aged people. So, uh, or people of different ages, we are all aged, right? Uh, but, so that there's now a 24-year-old, a 42-year-old, and a 70-year-old for these different. And there's also um, adjustments in material properties. Um, so you can get these as an, uh, I, I'm not sure that, that the add-on is really a good word, but <laughs> it, it's, they, it only exists for the average male and small female. And in this last version, which has also been a topic here, is robustness and stability, right? Uh, which is also something that can always become better. So that's, they've done some improvements on that. Um, and everyone, anyone who's used that, this model or even the thumbs model and tried to run it in, um, uh, in model checking in LS prepost, uh, you get a huge list of warnings. <laughs> that you have to just neglect. So every time you have a novice user, they get really scared because of all this warnings, and you go, oh, don't care about the warnings. <laughs> just go on, run. But so they've tried to reduce the warnings in the preprocessors. And also, you actually get them in the solver, the warnings. And a little bit improvements on different body parts. Oh, I forgot to click.
it's always interesting to look at a body turning, right? <laughs> it will keep on turning and get less and less. Uh, and then we come to what I mentioned also that um, just the past years, we've started to see human models go into certification, into your NCAP. Um, and that's the first application is pedestrian impacts, uh, where you can use models. And then there's a um, human model certification process, a document that the models have to fulfill, be within certain corridors and, and boundaries. So they've made sure that the pedestrian models fit this corridor. And that, that there are also some versions um, that fit this corridor, these corridors also. So there is now several different models you can choose between um, to fulfill this certification and do this testing. So some examples I got from Elements. Um, that this is the only automotive I'll show you. Uh, and someone showed a, a little bit of a swerving seat uh, in another presentation earlier. Uh, and so in future autonomous vehicles, we could sit any direction. Um, so here they've just put on top uh, people sitting. So the blue simulation is someone sitting rear facing, the red is sitting sort of forward facing in a crash, and then you have different angles in between. So you can, I think this is a good example of where we really have the strength in human body models because we can really know that we have the same body and we can just look at what does it mean in terms of, here it's kinematics of course, but you can also go into the model to see in terms of rib strains, in terms of number of rib fractures, um, and so on. Uh, to have different angles of your seat uh, in, in, an, in a future autonomous vehicle. Here's a research work they've done together with LIB um, in France, looking at obesity and creating obese models um, representing uh, PMHS experiments, and then taking these models and studying for different pulses and uh, because you can always debate whether it's, it's beneficial to have extra padding that can absorb the energy, uh, but on the other hand, you also have extra mass and inertia that will load your, load your body, right? So, so what they showed here is for frontal collisions, for the legs, there was, it was a higher severity. Um, with obesity, for the head, it was less severe. Um, uh, but if we look at statistics, uh, it's usually not beneficial with, uh, with uh, obesity because it also lo loads uh, your organs from a medical perspective. Um, and here's an example uh, looking at motorsports, uh, sort of similar to the karting <laughs> application. Um, so they were looking at the helmet foams. So the fringe plot here is the, the stress in the foam. And then it disappeared. Maybe if I go back. Um, trying to optimize the foam in the helmet to minimize head injuries. Um, and this I just thought was interesting. They've also um, done work to validate the models for postures and loading that would be relevant for space flights. And I think the, uh, the space flight suit helmet is just mostly for visual, <laughs> for impressing visually. But, uh, but I think this illustrates also the process of when we go to new applications that the models were not developed for. I mean, we always have to have an application in mind when we develop a model. Uh, on what kind of output do we want to take and, and how should it be validated. And as soon as we go outside that scope to a new application, we need to sort of run new validations to make sure that the model is valid in terms of kinematics, stresses and strains and so on, also for other loading scenarios or other postures. Um, and this is a study that we did together with Hufding. We developed an FE model of their Hevding airbag. Um, it's an airbag for urban cyclists. 
Um, because you can have also a nice hair. It won't be ruined by, uh, by your helmet. You just have it around your neck. Unless, of course, you're in a crash. But then I don't think you care so much about your hair anymore. <laughs> um, so they had a theory, uh, also coupling a little bit to the CART um, uh, study, that, that, it, that was actually beneficial also for the neck. Um, it would stabilize. So that's where we started, that's why we started this project with them, uh, looking at can we make a model and can we with the model see if there are any beneficial um, effects also on the neck structure. So what we did um, was we had three different models in this. It's actually several projects, but during the course of these projects, we've had several models. We had the original Viva model. We've had one of the simplified GHBMC average male models. And then we had a modular GHBMC model where we have simplified kinematic joints for the body, but for the head, brain, and neck, and spine, and also muscles on neck and, and back. Uh, we have the detailed anatomical model. And then, of course, we needed to put them on a cycle, right? So that was a little bit of a positioning challenge. Then we developed the validated Hövding airbag model, and we developed a, a model of just a generic sort of road cycling helmet to compare with. And then we wanted to make sure that we were not too far off from reality. I wouldn't call it a validation, but a comparison at least. So we compared simulations uh, to single bicycle accidents with uh, stunt people. So Hövding has done a lot of stunt person experiments, um, uh, running into different things and falling off the bikes uh, to work on the algorithms for, for this airbag. But we use that to validate the kinematics um, or to compare the kinematics and make sure we were not off. Um, and after that, we simulated multiple scenarios, um, two main uh, single type accident scenarios, biking into a, a concrete barrier or onto a, um, a, like if you go up on the sidewalk or pavement, like a small edge in different angles. And then we have three scenarios of vehicle to, to bicycle accidents. Uh, and then we varied the velocities and sort of the, the, the your, where you were in your pedal face on the bike and, and, and other things. So for the positioning, <clears throat> I think this is a good example of that this is one of the big challenges that's still out there for us working in HBM. So when we did the, the positioning of the Viva female model, we used the tools, the open source tools from the Piper project uh, to position the Viva, uh, uh, and it uses lightweight physics real-time simulations and rotations about the anatomical joints uh, of Viva. And we try to keep the neck intact because that's where we, so we never change the posture of the neck of the model. Uh, for the simplified GHBMC, we used LS prepost and we just prepositioned it so we knew where we wanted to have it. And then we defined those points. Uh, the red lines there uh, are cables. So we defined cables from the original position to the wanted position. And then we ran an LS Dyna simulation to actually move it to make sure that we were not morphing any elements, nothing was warped or changing, and that we got all the pre-strains um, that were there from the beginning. And for the modular GHBMC, we tried instead the software from Beta, the ANSA preprocessor, where you can do uh, art, uh, move articulations like if it had been a dummy model, but it also has, if it has uh, for, for example, the, where we have uh, for the neck and the spine and the hip, where it's not so obvious. If you do a larger movement like this, you saw that for the, for the Hans, I think really that things fold and doesn't, don't become really nice. So what this does is it actually changes the mesh and smooths, smooths the mesh uh, with a, a quite an intelligent um, algorithm. Um, and it worked really nicely for us to position the, from the occupant to the biker. So this is the end result. We had uh, 
just for the simplified and for the Viva, we had just one cycling position, and for the modular, we made two different cycling positions. Uh, and then we compared it to the stunt experiments. Um, so from a validation point of view, this was not perfect uh, footage, but it was what they had. <laughs> so we had to sort of work with that. But you can see this is when it, he, he bikes into this metal edge, the height of a sidewalk, and so does our model. So the bike and the feet are doing approximately the same thing. But you can see here that the stunt person is actually moving, uh, starting to move his foot to prepare for landing, and of course we don't have that kind of, of muscle activation in, in, the, in the model. Uh, and you can, see, you can see similarities. We mainly wanted to compare that we sort of got the same kind of back um, angle and the landing, but you can see also what he's doing is he's moving his, his uh, leg uh, also so that he won't get injured by the bike. And of course the model, model does not do that. The model gets tangled with the bike. And this is one of the concrete barriers. Um, here there was quite a big difference in terms of size, but we see we got the same kind of back angle, the same kind of landing. So we were quite happy with the, and we have more comparisons, but I'm not showing them here. We were quite happy with this, sort of we're in the right ballpark. And, and here are some of all the simulations we ran with the helmet, without any, hel any protection, with the Hovding airbag, and in the, all, a lot of different uh, accident scenarios. Some were faster and some were slower. These are slow motion videos, of course. <laughs> uh, but the higher the velocity of the vehicle, of course, the shorter the simulation and the faster it ran. So then we come to the output. So then that's where we need to know what are injury criteria that we can use. So the top here, uh, oh, sorry, up to all the way down here are sort of, we have the dummy criteria. Um, and I, I saw you use that also, sort of forces and movement and moments. And that's something you could measure in a dummy. That's not something we really can measure in the human body models because they don't have accelerometers, they have tissues. So, so it, and, the, and it's not really that kind of criteria we would optimally like to use. We would like to use tissue level criteria. So sort of like ligament strain and this we call normalized ligament strain because the strain is normalized with the failure strain. So a value one would mean a failure, a complete failure of that ligament. And then you could have a sub failure. So this is a predictor of an AIS one, which would be sort of a whiplash type injury. You can see some of these um, dummy-like criteria that we calculated their AIS-3, meaning their higher severity fractures type injuries. And for the head, we have the well-known HIC criteria, which is the dummy criteria. And then we have uh, strain-based criteria. And we know now that each model has its own criteria, depending on a little bit the material properties and the mesh. So this is a model-specific uh, thresholds coming from studies comparing to lots of accident data. So for the GHBMC, it happens to be for a mild traumatic brain injury, like a concussion, a value of 0.73, and for a severe a brain injury, a value of one. But if you use another model, it would be another criteria, right? Another value. Uh, so, so this means it's not really straightforward to take out things from the human body models we have. So I think a lot of work coming in sort of into the future outlook, I think something that is going to happen relatively soon is I think we need to have better processes for getting things out of our models and sort of agreeing on what are the values that we should take as output from these human body models. Uh, and, and how do we compare them? So for the principal strain, there is risk curves coupled to these strain values. But for this, for example, that's just uh, based on, um, on cadaveric experiments. So it's just a sort of a no failure failure. There's no risk curve coupled to it. So we need a lot more knowledge on how to couple the risk of injury to specific values that we measure in the human body models. 
Um, so what I'll show you now is the results for some of these criteria, not all of them, <laughs> that you wouldn't be able to read. It would be just filling the screen. Um, and the, just the solid bars are the ones without any protection. The striped on the side is the generic helmet, and the, the vertical stripes are the heavy. So if we look at the NIJ, NKM, and normalized ligament strains, we can see that they decrease um, with helmet use, but the helmet did not make a difference in the ligament strain, essentially meaning we will get the same kinematics of the neck uh, with this helmet as without any protection, whereas the hoofding changes actually the kinematics and then the stretch of the ligaments also. And the reason that this passes a threshold, but this does not, is that this is an AIS-3+, plus, a more severe injury. This is an AIS-1 criteria, so a less severe uh, whiplash-type injury. For the head, uh, no surprise. If you have a lot of padding, you get a lower acceleration of your head. That's essentially what we're showing, what we're seeing. Um, so without any protection, if you fall in 20 kilometers an hour and you land on asphalt, which we have as a material here, on landing you will get a high hick, but you will also get relatively high um, strains in the brain. So this reference value is for a concussion. And so this is actually predicting skull fracture then. Um, so here we see a huge benefit um, of hefting which is not surprising because it's much thicker than a helmet, meaning we have a larger distance to take up the energy before the impact goes into the head. And that's sort of the fundamental on, on, on uh, injury prevention. So this, I think, is still one of the trickiest things and one of the challenges we have for, to solve for the future is how to go from all the data we can extract from when we run a detailed model what are the relevant data to extract? What should we compare it to in order to know if it's better or worse um, than to predict injuries? So in this case, for the brain strain, this me uh, reference value here is a 50% risk of a concussion, meaning half, half of the people who get this value. So here, maybe 40% of people cycling into concrete barrier, 20 kilometers an hour would get a concussion, and 60% would not. So that's sort of the kind of data we would like. And how much time do I have? Yeah, okay. Um, so swapping from injury then to the, to the safer HPM, um, that we started developing when I was at Chalmers, um, and it's still being developed in a collaboration mainly between Chalmers, Outlive Research, and Volvo Cars. Um, the first focus was on muscles, to implement muscles to, to simulate pre-crash braking and bracing that could affect the result in the oncoming there is an oncoming uh, or a, a crash, subsequent crash. But also in long duration events, sort of like rollovers or run off road and then hit into something. Uh, but what they've done since I left Chalmers is they've really focused on uh, creating a mesh so that, the, that, so that the mesh is suitable for morphing. So that you could morph this model into um, uh, almost any adult percentile, um, leaving out the really extremes. But, uh, and also, that would make it easier to morph it into other positions if you're not using the marionette method. You've seen many of these pictures just showing the, you know, it's like all the other models, it has a skeleton, it has soft tissues, it has muscles, it has ligaments, and so on, and then on top, skin. Uh, and the reason I'm including it is right now it's proprietary, but they are really working hard uh, to release this model open source, which means that hopefully next year it's going to be available so that anyone can take it and then morph it uh, into whatever size and shape 
And I think then we will come to a point in traffic safety or sports safety or whatever you're looking into where we can find that what are the vulnerable individuals, not what's the average, the small, and then the two extremes, the small female and the large male, but what is actually, is it being short and obese or maybe tall and thin? Or what are the vulner vulnerable populations that we really would like to protect? And that, I think, can vary with the load scenarios we're looking at. And then we can start to understand that when we have those models available. So these are some applications where they looked at combinations of muscle activations and different load scenarios um, for um, driver and passenger with different um, protective systems. This is from Volvo cars. Um, and so are these. Oops, sorry. And oblique and side collisions, um, looking at what, how the restraints perform. And Autolib have recently done, gone into a lot of work um, uh, for two-wheelers, at uh, safety for the two-wheeler. So they're using this model um, as two-wheeler um, uh, drivers and then simulating collisions with, for example, vehicles in different scenarios. So they've done a lot of work uh, validating the model for this kind of load scenarios with um, experiments done in the US with PMHS and so on to make sure it's actually uh, um, relevant to use the model for these kind of load scenarios also. And then to the child models. So, um, So the bodies here were from the Casper project. Um, and then, as they did not have the heads from that project, there were new head and brain models and neck models developed to couple to the rest of the bodies in this EU project. So this just shows you sort of the level of detail and the number of, of the relatively high level of detail for this child model. Um, and then, from the beginning, they wanted this model to be scalable so that they could go from, from a, a small child to a larger child. So the, the, the available tools scales from one and a half to six year old, but actually there's data there. So you can actually scale from just a few months up to 18 years, which is adult then. So there is data to scale most of this uh, model uh, all the way up to adult. So this is the answer to the question from this morning. Uh, so here you see normalized people of different ages. <laughs> and you can see that a quarter of the newborn is the head, meaning that the head mass is enormous in relation to the rest of the body. The neck is non-existent, <laughs> right? Uh, then half of the child is back and a little bit legs. Uh, and with age, it changes to the adult, where you have about one-eighth of the adult is head, right? So it's, it's much less. So that means for the, for the really small kids, um, the most important thing we need to account for when it comes to, to safety is, is the head mass and the really, really tiny slender neck of the younger children. Uh, and then I'll show you also for the six and 12 year olds, because the pelvis doesn't, doesn't develop fully until puberty, which is somewhere around here. So I think we actually have a knowledge gap in terms of teenagers. We would need more research on biomechanics of teenagers for crash uh, in order to model these, or pre-puberty, pre-teens maybe, in a good way. There's really no model capturing, and the pelvis is important. Um, everyone working with traffic safety knows it's an important interaction with the seat belt, right? So I'll show you that. So this is for the neck. We have the head mass of the young children, but we also have the facet joint angles in the, uh, in the neck. And you can see for a one-year-old uh, or, uh, or an infant, it's almost flat, meaning there's no resistance to shearing. 
structural resistance. For an adult, we have a much higher angle, and then we have a structural resistance to shear. So if you have a high load here, and you stop the thorax, sorry, I'll stop somewhere else, not on the microphone. You stop the thorax with your seat belt, or, a, or a five, even worse, a five-point harness, maybe. The head continues forward, and there's no structural resistance to shear in the neck. Then you decapitate the child. Um, so so it's, it was really important to include this cha age change with the set joint ang angle. So that's implemented in the scaling using the Piper tool. So here you can see the Piper models for one and a half, six, and 18 year olds. And I highlighted with the red line sort of the set joint angles. So the, the, the sort of the head mass and all that, and also the neck is captured in the Piper models when you do the scaling with that tool. And that's why the rear-facing seat was developed. This is Professor Bertil Altman from Chalmers. And he thought, we can send people to space, but we cannot save our children. So why don't we treat them as astronauts? And they travel in the space, they travel backwards, because no one would survive traveling forward into space. So he's like, well, let's just have the small kids travel backwards then. So this is the first prototype. If you're ever in Gothenburg, I think you can look at it at SAFER, Vehicle and Traffic Safety Center, or possibly at the Volvo Museum. I'm not sure where it sits right now. It's been going a little bit back and forward. So it's the first prototype of the child seat. And it looks very much like the modern child seat we have today. Less rabbits and superheroes on the padding. but. And that's the first crash test uh, done with a little wooden dummy inside. So that's a really small child, but if we look at the preteens then, and we have the pelvis, so this is the shape of the pelvis, and you have the seat belt, and what, what's holding it in place is the iliac crest. Most of us can feel it here, uh, but that doesn't develop until puberty. So for a child, your pelvis looks like this black shadow. So there's nothing holding the seatbelt, stopping the seatbelt from just um, continuing to travel over the pelvis and into your, your soft abdomen, right? Um, causing lots of really severe abdominal injuries with submarining. Uh, so that's also implemented age-wise. This is a six-year-old. But since it only goes to six years, that's why I see that there's, we have a, 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 a hole with, really, we would need models of the six, from six-year-old up to puberty when it comes to the pelvis to look at our, our systems, to make sure that they're also, because most preteens go forward like the adults, and they sit in the adult system. They, most of them don't even sit on booster cushions. So what the booster cushion, this is my son a long time ago. He just turned 18. Uh, here I think he was five or six. What it does is it, it changes, first of all, it raises the child up, so it changes the angle of the belt, meaning it goes more over the legs rather than towards the stomach. But you also have this hook, which does the work of the iliac crest <laughs> that they don't have, keeps it from traveling upwards. But the preteens, they don't sit on those booster seats. <laughs> Unless maybe possibly they are very small and they have a very safety conscious parent. Uh, which meaning I don't think they have optimal safety in the vehicles today. So we need to develop these models first for this age span. At KTH, they've done some nice work with the Piper model. They were part of the Piper consortium. So they did a number of uh, case reconstructions, both physical and numerical. Um, so here are three cases, a, a little bit older than two-year-old, um, sitting like this, and had a, quite a severe injury, an MIS-4. Six is fatal, it's a five-year-old over there. And here you have a five-year-old sitting on a booster cushion and sustaining no injuries. So they simulated these. These are the pulses from the reconstructed vehicles. And here you can see simulations of these 
uh, three accident reconstructions. And you can really see the head impact and the severe. And if you think about that, that neck not having really a, a resistance to shear, we have severe injuries. Um, so for the skull fracture prediction, they used von Mises stress. Again, for the brain, it was a strain-based criteria. Um, so here you can see the high strains in the brain because of that head impact. Uh, for the non-injured, uh, they were happy to see they had low strains. Um, and for the, for the other fatality, they had a, um, the um, cervical spine had severe injuries that were the fatal ones, I think. So they looked at shear strain in the intervertebral discs for that. And then they, when they've done that, they continued the work uh, looking at different misuse of child restraints. So simulating um, proper restraint in the, in the seat and different kinds of misuse. You have it under your arms or you have, you have, not, you have lots of winter clothes on your baby and you don't pull the straps so they're not really fastened. And so they varied uh, a lot of difference both for the, uh, the, the younger child and for the booster cushion, a little bit older child. Uh, and here's just the two most severe scenarios that they simulated. And you can see the strains in the brain here in the von Mises. Yeah. And then again, we come back to how do we go from the von Mises strain of a child brain to some kind of injury? And for that, we need data. And there's, of course, a lack of data. So what they did was here's uh, the this top line here is the threshold for fracture, skull fractures in adults. And then there, there was a 5% uh, risk and 90% risk of skull fracture for nine months old. And this child was two years. So then we know that the threshold is somewhere in between. Should I finish? Yes. So the equestrian work really fast, what we did was we used, we wanted to see the impact testing standards today, which also comes into, I think, the CART application, uh, are they representative of real-world accidents? So we used the VIVA model, created a just optimal vest. You could never put it on because it doesn't have an opening, or you can never take it off if you have it on. Uh, so this is what the testing is, looks like today. Uh, two and a half kilo weight is dropped at 5.3 meters per second and, uh, on the metal surface. So we, I compared that with uh, falls, typical falls from horses, where you usually land on your side or front from accidental data. And here is landing on a, a fence, an obstacle, a fixed obstacle. And a, a normal, typical speed of a horse uh, in jumping competitions is between four and a half and nine meters per second. So we simulated both, and with and without the safety vest. Um, and of course, the number of predicted fractures based on the strain in the ribs decreased. And here you can see that we have a risk curves for different ages. So there's quite a lot of good work done on rib fracture prediction coming out from Chalmers right now. And then we compared it. So the duration of the impact for the standard testing was 15 milliseconds. For a, for a fall accident, we have a duration of about 100 milliseconds. And for the going into the fence, 90 and 60 milliseconds. So the, the standard testing is much shorter in terms of time than accidents. So, but if we look then at the vest, which we are evaluating, what's the maximum compression of the vest? So in the testing, it's 60%. In a fall, only 38%. And going into the obstacles, it's much higher than it's closer or higher than um, in the testing. So then what's the speed of compression? Because if we want these standards to distinguish between uh, materials that are, are velocity sensitive and it's all energy different velocity, we want the testing to capture sort of velocities that represent it for real life. We see that it's much faster, uh, 3.8 meters per second deformation compared to only 0.4 in a fall accident, which means we could actually have materials that will be too stiff 
here, but would work really nicely here to absorb energy. Um, and it's, that's possibly, this one is po possibly representative of having a hoof kick into your chest or this really severe high velocity here. But my conclusion based on this is we would need to change the, the testing standards of riding vests to better represent this scenario as well. So that was short, sorry. Or no questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here in the coffee break. Oh, it's uh, nice to see you in the view. Um, but just a short, quick one. Okay. okay. Um, there was a guy, um, remember the, there was a question in the morning about the research topics. Uh, yes. What, what are people working on? What's the direction? So if you want to do a PhD, the question was if you want to do a PhD in, in human body modeling, what should you go for? And I th my default answer would be, I would go for what they are really skilled at, at the university where you are. <laughs> Because you, you really want to have a good professor. Um, so I think it's more important to find a good professor than exactly the right topic. But then when it comes to topics, I really th I would like to see someone go into the preteen um, uh, modeling. So basically closing yeah. the existing gap. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. Finding existing gaps and closing them. Okay, so we make another break. Uh, we change the schedule a little bit, so we continue at 3 o'clock instead of 2.45, okay? So three o'clock or the full hour, wherever you are located. Okay, um, welcome back everyone. This is now the last session and the next speaker is uh, Wolfgang Ehlers. He's a former professor at the University of Stuttgart and actually he's my former uh, advisor uh, during my PhD thesis. And he was a professor at the uh, Continuum uh, continu uh, continu Mechanics Institute at the University of Stuttgart. And now he's talking about uh, actually cancer growth or cancer growth simulation. Okay, now we can start. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mike has asked me if I would be able to give a presentation here on a biomechanical topic. And I have one that is quite new. It belongs to a publication that, that appeared in the early 2022 and is on metastatic lung cancer cell proliferation and atrophy in brain tissue, basically. That means we have experiments on, uh, on, on the lung cancer cell clusters and we wanted to describe these as a, as, a, as a cancer in the brain, so it is a metastasis, of course. So what we are going to do is we, we are looking to the equations that are needed to describe this com complex topic, meaning we have a brain. The brain it has a solid part. It has a tumor part if the tumor appears. Then, of course, we have the fluid, the interstitial fluid, and the blood in different compartments. And in the uh, capillary bed, these compartments open and the things come, come together. That means we have to describe various continua, a solid, a fluid, and a blood, and they interact freely concerning exchange of mass, concerning exchange of momentum, and so forth. So let us start. I hope I can use this really correctly. You see the outline. Most of this outline was just, uh, just said. Uh, we not have to look into the equations. Of course, we need then considerative equation to describe that and to model that. And these considerative equations have to be found by an exploitation of the entropy inequality and the thermodynamical restrictions resulting from that to see that these equations are admissible and in a certain sense correct and can therefore be needed. Then of course we look to the ingredients, that is the blood saturation, in including the angiogenesis process because such a cancer cell uh, is quite intelligent once it's a cancer cluster. Because then if the chance of malnutrition comes into play, it sends out vascular endothelial growth factors meaning that the, that, the, that the blood arteries are, are drawn to it, deliver new, new nutrients, and so the cluster growth can go on. Then, of course, we'll have a look to the brain skeleton, and, and it, a particular to the growth-dependent finite solid elasticity in describing this tumor material in the frame of uh, elasticity, although the material is very viscous in a certain sense. Then, of course, what is important is that we have to a look to these metastatic proliferation and atrophy, meaning the growth of cancer and the opposite of this. 
Then we need equations. These are the so-called weak forms of the governing equations. These equations need, need parameters that are partly taken from experimental data. Finally, we can then study these data compared to the numerical solutions, and we comp can compute 2D and 3D numerical models. So once this is done, I will give you uh, short remarks on, uh, let me say, investigations that we have done in the last years. So let us start with the first slide here. So what we have is a material, and the material uh, may be looked at at this point. We have so-called volume fractions given by this letter N, and that means we have a solid volume fraction, and solid is the most part. We have the blood and we have the interstitial fluids, so three, three basic components which are included here. Then, of course, if a tumor comes into play, the uh, volume fraction of the blood consists of the volume fraction of the, of, of the solid brain and of the solid tumor. We have the blood liquid it itself. We, we say this is only a liquid. And then we look to the interstitial fluid that is composed of the, of, of the um, interstitial fluid solvent, the nutrients, the cancer cells, the vascular endothelial growth factors, and medical drugs that uh, are especially some kind of, of uh, chemotherapies. So with this in mind, we, we know what the model is. It is composed of these components, as I said before. And then we can come to the equations that describe this. So I will show you some equations, unfortunately. But without equations, there is no ongoing of, of, of science in this sense. I will do it quickly. And I will not explain each of these equations, only that you see there are any that are used in this theory. So uh, in this model, it looks, at the first glance, very simple, because we Oh, sorry, did I do something? No. At the first glance, it looks very simple as we only use the mass and momentum balances. The energy balance can be taken off because there is no temporal change. All uh, is, is computed and also in reality at approximately 37 degrees C. So um, with, with this, we have, I said, the mass balance. We have here the partial density of, of a component alpha. Alpha can be solid, liquid, or interstitial fluid. Then partial density means it is a combination of the local volume fraction times the effectives. That means the real density, the real weight of that, of, of that material. Uh, prime alpha is the so-called material time derivative. We have the divergence of the velocity times the partial density. This is all as in one component material. Um, although in one component material, we have on the right side a zero. And here have this, this density hat alpha term. This is the so-called mass production that is valid for the description of the interaction of the different components which is other. That means that, that the uh, continuum of, of this uh, material alpha is an open system. And once the total material is a closed system, we obtain a constraint, namely that all these productions sum up to 0. Concerning the momentum balance, we have the, let me say, the inertia terms on the left side, divergence of the Cauchy stresses here, gravitational forces, and then again a coupling term. And this coupling term is the so-called direct momentum production. And that is a local mean value of all the terms that are interconnecting uh, on one constituent, for in this case, the constituent alpha. Again, open system, I said. And we, as we also have a closed system up of all constituents, you see here we have the direct terms. And we have the momentum production that comes into play as a result of the lower constitutive equation, namely the mass exchange. So these are the equations we are looking at. Uh, we can uh, uh, um, uh, tra transform them to the solid mass equation, liquid mass, and, and blood mass equation. And then we need the overall momentum balance, summing up all these momentum balances under the assumption that we can neglect the inertia forces. That means we have, we have something like a quasi-static situation. What is further more interesting is if we integrate the mass balance, we usually obtain a relation, partial density in the current configuration as a function of the partial density in the initial configuration times the inverse of the, de of the determinant of the material time derivative, uh, sorry, of the material deformation gradient. So uh, what we have here, as a result of the existence of this term here, we, extain, we, 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 we obtain this additional exponential function, such that also the growth factors are included in the momentum balance. Furthermore, as a result of material incompressibility of the components, especially of the solid, we can divide all these, this left equation by the solid density and obtain a similar equation for the solid volume fraction. This finding is important. As the sum of all the vol volume fractions yields 1, so we have now the solid volume fraction. And what we can then compute is the, is the porosity, 
that is 1 minus ns. But the porosity now splits into the volume fraction of the interstitial fluid and of, this, of the blood. And there is no further, no further information from geometry to get a result there. Otherwise, that this means that we need a considerative equation. Considerative equations, as I said before, are based on an exploitation of the entropy inequality. And we find, for example, the solid stress as uh, given by two components. The first one is governed by the so-called pore pressure. And the pore pressure, as you can see here, is a combination of the uh, interstitial fluid pressure and of the blood pressure. And the combining factor is the solid, uh, is, is the blood saturation as B. And this saturation is obtained by taking the volume fraction of the blood over the sum of the volume fraction of the interstitial fluid and the blood, meaning the porosity. Furthermore, we have the so-called effective stresses that has its usual shape. And the effective stresses are defined as that stress that is a result of geometrical deformations that are coming up here in a material without temperature changes. So having a closer look to the pressures, we have here the, tensor, the, the, the um, stress tensor of the blood that is only governed by the pressure. The interstitial fluid tensor is also only governed by this pressure. And furthermore, we obtain an information from the entropy inequality as we cannot define what SB is or what, the, what one of the pressures are. So we have a, a, an information that we can construct a difference pressure as a function of SB that gets this result. And from that, we get the necessary information to find out all our geometrical informations. Furthermore, a quick view here. The interstitial fluid pressure, of course, has a mechanical part and an osmotical part that stems from the summation over the species in the interstitial fluid. So with this information given back to the momentum balances of interstitial fluid and blood, we obtain this equation for the motion of the two fluids, namely this is the so-called filter velocity with WB as the seepage velocity. And you see here the permeabilities over the shear viscosity of the fluids and for the uh, interstitial fluid, it's comparable. Additionally, we need diffusion equations where the, same equa where the same kind of structure of these equations is obtained. So with this in mind, we can go one step further. We need an, a, a description of the blood angiogenesis here and the saturation. And that can be done by the help of a so-called sigmoid function. And a sigmoid function is known as an S-shaped function. And with that, you see the equations here. And this belongs to that set of equations that I do not uh, speak about in detail. You see we can uh, de define the saturation as a, as a function of the difference pressure when our pressures are known. Or we can define the difference pressure as a function of the saturation in case that only one pressure is known to compute the other one. So then, next step, the solid skeleton. Again, our considerative equation as before. We need a split of the deformation gradient in a mechanical part and a gross depending part. And uh, that, of course, has consequences. And you see this integrated form of the volume balance that we found on the second or third slide uh, tells us that there is also now a volume fraction in the gross configuration that can be uh, uh, computed from its initial value and the determinant of the uh, gross depending part of the deformation gradient. That leads us also to some kind of an a priori constitutive equation, namely that this term governs exactly this determinant. And as we would look to growth only in a volumetric, volumetrical sense, we then have also the concerning constitutive equation. And that leads to a description of the right and left Cauchy-Green deformation tensors. OK. Then finally, we need a constitutive equation for the effective stresses that can be found in this final form here. You see we have the left Cauchy-Green tensors. We have the determinants of the growth and the total uh, uh, volume fraction terms here, and we have these terms here uh, once again. So with these, we now come to another interesting point, namely, what do the metastases do, how do they grow, and how do they do the opposite of growth? We have these mass pro sorry, I always get the wrong pointer here. We have these uh, production terms, and these production terms have, of course, an opponent in the interstitial fluid. And this can, can be broken down to all the species in the interstitial fluid, nutrients, cancer cells, vesco, vascular endothelial growth factor, and drugs. From thermodynamical restrictions, we obtain this equation. And in this equation, we need to compute these terms, for example. Uh, that means particularly we are looking to proliferation. That means growth. Growth happens mainly uh, if uh, enough nutrients are there. This is based on a theory that is called monokinetics. 
a theory that, that, that's stemming from, from, from chemo uh, uh, um, biology. And in case of atrophy, which is the opposite of uh, proliferation, meaning either necrosis as a result of malnutrition, or meaning apoptosis as a result of chemical drugs. So that has to be described. I take one part off here, namely this here, that is the production of the solid tumor. The production is positive, and the production is, is part, or the part of this production is a result of the existence of nutrients in the interstitial fluid. Uh, the tumor has the same uh, partial density as the, 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 the brain, so we, we take this value. We have here a heavy side function, we have the maximum proliferation rate, and we have here the molar concentration of nutrients minus a threshold value. And once this reaches the, th the threshold value, we have a switch, namely that H1 changes from 0 to 1. So with this in mind, we, have, we, we can compute our problem here. And uh, we need the weak form of the governing equations. We have a fully coupled system. And in the fully coupled system, we have the overall momentum balance in a version that is called weak version, tested by delta U. Delta U, or U is the solid deformation vector. Then we have the volume balances of blood and interstitial fluid that can be tested by both pressures. And once we use a bubnov galerkin scheme for the solution, we then obtain also information for the pressures. In other words, we can now compute the saturation as a function of the difference of these pressures. Then we have the concentration balances that have, that have to be uh, multiplied by delta C, and that is the, the molar concentrations of the, of the species inside the interstitial fluid. All this is coupled in our solver pandas by use of Taylor-Hood elements, meaning we have a quadratic approximation function for the deformation and linear approximation function for all the other uh, things who are here included. So it's a highly complex and highly different, difficult to compute situation here. And uh, what we still need are the material parameters that have to, to, to be identified and to optimize. He will make use of the so-called sampling method by Morris and that includes a so-called elementary effect and an absolute mean of the elementary effect and of course also sensitivities that give us information what parameters are more important than other ones. Then of course we use the, the parameter optimization uh, by use of the likelihood method to come along with the results. Only to have a look at, we have the experimental data and uh, to combine it with a numerical solution. These experimental data have been taken on well plates in the lab of the Institute of Cell Biology and Immunology by Daniela Stör. And, and uh, the, this, this institute is led by Professor Morrison at the University of Stuttgart. What you see here are the numbers that come out of these computations. More interesting are these figures. You have here a line that has 400 microns, 400 microns. This is 1,000 microns that has another scale. And this is taken after three days, after seven days, and after 11 days. Only let a very little tumor cluster grow under the existence of enough nutrients. To come to uh, the material parameters by optimization, we take a finite element mesh here in two dimensions, very easy. And uh, we have, a, uh, we have a, this, this found by, with a diameter of 20 centimeter. You see then, for example, after seven days, the result. On top, the initial value where you can, we cannot see in this dimension the cluster, the very little cluster, and at the end, the grown cluster, which is here zoomed out. So at the beginning, we have a cluster that spreads from 2.5 millimeter in, in, in diameter towards 10.8 millimeter, and uh, if we compare that to a sphere, that would lead to a volume growth of factor 80. So it's quite much, quite, quite much. Tumors are growing once they uh, past the micromechanical switch, they are going quite uh, quickly. Um, the next is have a quick look to the material parameters. Some have been optimized, other ones have been taken from the literature, and those who were found not so important have simply been chosen uh, in a um, uh, uh, good way, I would say. So let us have a look to the results. This problem looks at the problem before. It is this uh, sphere with 20 centimeter diameter. We set at the boundary all uh, motion for the solid equal to zero. That is the model of the skull. The brain is inside. Then we have initial values of the pressures outside and inside. We have a point A defined here where the interstitial fluid is pressed in with all its ingredients. And the interstitial fluid can flow, flow out, for example, at these edges here. 
and uh, the, only the species are uh, in and they, they can be then consumed inside. Here we have the volume fraction of the solid tumor over time. We have the concentration of the nutrients, molar concentrations over time. We have the mass that looks uh, equivalent to that. And we have the uh, molar concentration of the drug over time. Let us first have a look to this one here. So it starts at zero. No volume fraction can be defined because the tumor cluster Lee is so small that it only can compute it by means of a molar uh, v v value. So nevertheless, it grows. And then it appears that we reach in this experiment day 57. At day 57, the micromechanical micro switch happens, meaning that now the cluster has a size that can firstly be described by means of a volume fraction. After this micromechanical switch, the cluster is, is, incre in, is, in, is increasing very rapidly. And at the same time, as it increases, you see the nutrients are nearly, there's no, no, nearly no nutrient consumption. But then, during the increase, a very steep decrease of the amount of nutrients. That means the tumor takes all the nutrients for growing. At day 77, the cluster has a size that a, a, a surgeon in a hospital can, can recognize it. And once it is recognized, he gives a, a chemotherapy, a chemical drug. And the chemical drug you can see here is, give, is given at day 77, steep increase. It is uh, assumed by the, by the tumor a decrease, and the uh, treatment ends at day 80. So what happens? In the meanwhile, you see the, the tumor for volume fraction has a steep descent. But then once it stops, it changes its direction. That means it regrows. And this is the, um, the important and dangerous factor in cancer therapy, as we will see in the next slide. So this is now my final slide to this topic, a non-symmetric 3D simulation of a tumor treatment. You see we have again this skull, which is for easy com computing a sphere. You see the tumor in the middle is quite big. And uh, as it is quite big, the, the surgeon decides to drill in a hole in the, in the skull and to bring in a, a catheter or an infusion needle. Uh, this is done to bring the chemotherapy as close as possible to the point where, they, where it has to act because otherwise all the other parts of the brain are taken into consideration here, and that is not so good. Then he decides to give four infusions with a, a molar concentration of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4 mole per cubic meter, and uh, the, the, the material is called trial. But what trial is, I must write it down, because otherwise I can't remember. That is tumor necrosis factor-related apoptosis inducing ligand. So you know, you know what it is. Maybe somebody of you who's stemming basically from chemistry knows what it means. That means it is the, the, the program that tells the tumor cell, you have to die immediately. And the cell does it. Unfortunately, also other cells are compromised by it that are in, 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 the, in, the, in the surrounding. So if we start now the treatment, we give the first infusion. You see the material is coming in. You see the reaction of the tumor is shrinking. But it regrows. Yeah? Then, of course, we have further infusion, second one. The tumor is just shrinking even more, but decides again to regrow. Five days later, the same procedure. The tumor is vanished. What, do, what does happen? It regrows, yeah? For safety, fourth uh, injection. And now the hope is that the tumor will not regrow. But unfortunately, as we let the computation run, it regrows again. And this is the basic problem, because then, the surgeon has to decide, sh shall I give more infusions, meaning that the patient has also very negative effects of that, or do I stop it? In both cases, what happens is not the best, I can only say. Yeah? So with this, I would uh, close this topic. And uh, as, as Mike asked me to speak also about some different things, I will do it at the end. I hope I have lost some, some minutes uh, of my presentation. This is a showcase human brain tissue that stems from the um, uh, what could I say? From, from the presentation we made as our cluster of excellence in simulation te technology went from the first to the second, I think, to, 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 the, to, the, to the second phase. And uh, what, what we see here is uh, the human. The human has a skull. In the skull, the human has a brain. Uh, and in the brain, uh, a surgeon finds a tumor. So the, the problem is as before. The tumor is here. And in this uh, kind of application, you can make an optimization to find the position where this in infusion needle should be uh, brought into the skull for an optimal result. Uh, 
Next is, of course, we have a model. The model is the theory of porous media. That means, you, for example, you see here the blood vessel system, quite complex, all in the brain. This is smeared out as if everywhere would be brain in a certain lower amount. The same is true for the gray and white matter. That means the solid brain. And then, of course, for the interstitial fluid. So the model that comes into play is the theory of porous media, smearing out the microstructure towards volume uh, parts, your, your, your volume increments that split in solid in interstitial fluid and blood volumes as before. Then, of course, we have to look to find data. Uh, the data should be found from observation of the real skull here. And uh, from, uh, for, for the real skull, it was possible by use of diffusion tensor imaging to get uh, values for the anisotropic structure of, of the brain, uh, particular to find values to find values for the permeabilities and uh, for, for the diffusivities, the permeabilities, and the direction of anisotropy. So with this, one can now compute the problem. The problem is here uh, in, in a different mesh that is one slice of the brain on the left and one hemisphere of the brain of the right. And then you can see, for example, in these, in the, in these examples here with one needle, how the, um, uh, how the medical drug uh, spreads into the tumor. And from that, uh, you, you, can find optimized, you, can, you can find an optimization of, of, of the strategies. So then I would like to go to another example. The another example has something to do with your back to the spine and to the intervertebral discs, and the intervertebral discs are swelling materials like hydrogel. This started a little early, and you see there this black thing uh, that is a suit-colored, a suit-colored, uh, uh, um, suit uh, what is it, hydrogel. And once it, it grows, it takes up so much liquid that its size is 16, 16 times larger than, than before. And of course, you know this material is used in pampas for for known purposes, I would say, and it works also there very well. So the computation of this um, can be seen here, for example. You, you see we, we modeled this behavior also not so drastically in, in its result, but it is possible to use the swelling as a result of the existence of fixed negative charges at the skeleton. And once you bring this material into another solution where the, the let me say, the, the combination of positive and negative ions is differently, then of course it swells. And this swelling is known by, by everybody who is older than 50 years, for example by me. When I in the evening eat a, a, a salty sausage, and then in the other morning I'm approximately one kilo um, heavier than the day before. And that is nothing than swelling in all my bodies, or so to say. And the same is true with the intervertebral disc. The intervertebral disc is there, such that the, the, the uh, vertebrae bodies can be moved and the spine can be moved. So you can bend in this direction or in that direction as you want. And that means during this motion, you press out interstitial fluid out of the, uh, in, it, uh, um, out of the, the disc. And as the disc has no blood inside, it also gets its nutrients by sucking up interstitial fluid where nutrients are then coming with it. So if, the, if, the, if people get older, and this function is no longer there, then you get a calcification of that uh, part of the spine that you then would, would look at. Uh, you, you see here, for example, another uh, computation of a numerical example from the, or in an experiment that has been taken by Gerhard Holzapfel at the University of, of Graz. Uh, also here, if um, an, this, this part of, this, of, of the spine is taken out of a dead person, and cut into, two parts, into, into parts, you see immediately how the, uh, um, analus, the, the nucleus pulposus is swelling out here. So final uh, thing comes up here. You see a person, only the, the bones without the head, but the motion, the form bending to the front fraction, is, is, you, you, you can look at. You see we have here the intervertebral disc and the and, and, uh, the, the intervertebral disc and, and, and the vertebral body, you see these red lines that are all the, the points where the muscles act, such that this motion is possible. Then, of course, um, we see how the intervertebral disc is deformed at this uh, motion. Fluid is driven out and suck it in again. And uh, we describe this then, of course, as before, by means of the theory of porous media. I will not explain it again. It is the same as before. 
Then, of course, the muscles do something, and the muscles get their information by electrical signals. And the signaling is here on the right. Uh, you, you see the signals coming up, and as a result of these signals, you have the muscle motion, and that is quasi, it's quasi a chemical reaction of the muscle to, to this um, electrical information. Last thing, you see now this complex part of two vertebrae. You see the collagen fibers around. They, they are part of the annulus fibrosus, and they are crossed in two directions to, uh, to, to stabilize the intervertebral disc. And what you can see in between, that is this bar here that is moving everywhere too, that is the axis of rotation that is, that is marching around as a function of what I'm doing with my motion. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would say with these informations, I'm coming to close my presentation. I hope it was, in a sense, interesting for you, and uh, I thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Wolfgang. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, English. It was interesting to see that um, what you actually can do with the right model at hand, as to what kind of complex mechanisms you actually can formulate. I, I didn't expect to like, be able to compute like, something like a ten, cancer growth in reaction to also um, to the degrowth because of the drug infusion and then how it grows again, so it's pretty easy. Just putting aside all the complex formulations you have at the beginning where you have to go through this. Um, are there any questions, comments from the audience? Yeah? First, thank you very much. Um, I have a question regarding the, the growth of cancer and nutrition of cancer, because once I read, and I have very little knowledge about this, but um, somebody called it paradox that in mice and in elephants, um, despite elephants have much more cells than mice, elephants um, do not have higher risk of deadly cancer, but they do have a higher risk of cancer at all, but there are different cancers that are fighting each other. So a hostile cell can take the nutrition of another hostile cell. And can you use your model to simulate this type of behavior? For example, having some hostile cells fighting against cancer without using drugs, for example? That is a very interesting question, I could say. But unfortunately, I'm not a specialist on elephants and mice. Uh, we have been studying the let me say, the cancer problem basically. And what basically happens is that these cancers are clustering, the clustering are growing, and they only get nutrition by diffusion processes at the beginning. And once the inner part of the cell cluster doesn't get enough nutrients, the, the cluster cells are vascular endothelial growth factors, and these make the arteries grow towards the, uh, the, the tumor and to give him what, what he needs, namely nutrients. If now one cancer type has to struggle against another one, this is possible, but normally I would say one, one individuum uh, evolves one cancer type and not two cancer types at the same time. If this happens, yeah, it might be possible that one cancer cell is more mighty than another one and takes away the nutrients from that one, but I'm not informed in detail over that, so I cannot answer this question. Okay. Another one? Okay, um, so we are perfect back in schedule, by the way, which is good. So then we all ask uh, our last speaker, which is Dirk Fressmann, also from Dynamo this time. And um, he will give an outlook about Hans again, and um, he will talk about the future aspects of it, which direction, what to do, what's left to do. Okay, I cannot point, but uh, at least I can go through the... Okay, okay, thank you. And welcome to the second part of our presentation of the, um, of the Hans human body model. Uh, so we've seen a lot of, um, yeah, this is basically, so a brief outlook uh, on what we will working on uh, during the next couple of weeks and months. And um, so we've seen a lot of very interesting presentations today. So I think we have to extend the list uh, basically to infinity. <laughs> um, so the good, the thing is that we almost uh, or mostly finished uh, the model assembly of the Hans model. So in terms of meshing, uh, uh, the material assignment, uh, different contact conditions, uh, and especially the attachment of the connective tissue and tendons uh, to the 
uh, uh, to the bones. Um, so um, we organized the model into five different functional layers. Here. Um, so what we learned uh, this morning, we mainly focus on the uh, on the so-called musculoskeletal system, and we 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 also have basic inner organs modeled in the model. Um, we also started work, uh, as it was also presented this morning, uh, on the simulation-based model positioning. Basically, the goal is to create a first version of the sitting model. Um, for this, we added some simplified drifted muzzle fibers uh, to improve uh, uh, the muzzle motion. Here we are. Um, and we learned that we have to take a deeper look into the adipose tissue and the uh, different skin models uh, needed since uh, this, is not be, uh, this is not actually not deforming as we expected to. So uh, this is something we have to also uh, take a deeper look into. Um, what we will do um, within the next couple of weeks and months, we will certainly improve uh, the total model response, um, especially uh, concerning the different model connections, uh, so basically tenants uh, to the bones. Uh, the material uh, parameters can, of course, be tuned. Sorry. Um, OK. Um, and we have to do some fine tuning uh, of the muzzle sectioning. Um, so basically, what is muzzle, <laughs> what is uh, tendon, and, uh, and what is this um, muotennial junction? Um, as you can see here on the right side, this is a motion of the, uh, of the shoulder joint. And you see there's a lot of going, uh, going on here, so especially in this area. So in this area here. And so uh, we have a lot of interaction between the different muscles, uh, between the bones and all the tendons. And uh, the motion of the shoulder actually is very, uh, uh, so very much depends on the sectioning of the muscle. So basically, what is muscle, what is tendon? And, and um, so we see that this might be a little bit of a, uh, of a problem here in the, in the shoulder, since we have a large portion of uh, uh, of the tendon and of this uh, 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 transition zone, and uh, this is something we might uh, uh, that we might improve uh, during the next couple of weeks. Um, then we have other points here. Uh, so we are planning to add a thickness distribution to the cortical ribs, uh, where we actually have some data available, but uh, we had uh, uh, we still have to uh, we still have to uh, uh, to map the data to the cortical rib bones. Um, then we have to do some fine tuning of this, uh, uh, this microfiber technology uh, uh, for the different muscles. Um, we definitely have to work on the brain. So the brain is not really so, uh, uh, so existent here, but this will uh, be also done uh, uh, during the next couple of weeks. And then, of course, finally, we are planning to do uh, uh, to add some damage-based bone failure criteria here, and also um, to add and calibrate uh, the different risk function for uh, for, uh, for different injuries um, uh, within the model. <clears throat> um, concerning the load case catalogs, so there is a number of publicly available load case catalogs. Um, uh, um, uh, available uh, to basically do the model calibration and the model validation here. First might be uh, uh, from the some users community, there's a bunch of load cases available uh, that you can download, um, even with some load case summaries and uh, uh, the setups are also av uh, available. Uh, so we will uh, take a deeper look into this here. Then from this, um, Uh, from this H HPM for uh, VT uh, group, there is an extensive list of different uh, load case um, or different publications concerning uh, frontal and lateral impact uh, situations, um, which we will uh, uh, definitely also take a deeper, uh, uh, a deeper look into it um, to just to basically calibrate and, uh, and uh, also validate our model.
Um, so the model release, so we are still planning to uh, release a first version of the model later this year, so late summer, maybe Q4 of 2023. Um, there's some, something going on here. Um, uh, the model uses the R12 version of LS uh, Dyna currently, so this is uh, the development version, but we will certainly also cross-check with some newer versions, R13, maybe R14 sometimes. Um, uh, our main unit system is currently kilogram, uh, millimeter, milliseconds, and kilonewtons, but we will certainly uh, deliver the model also with uh, two other uh, unit systems here. Uh, we will also deliver the model in a, in a standing and in a seated posture. Um, there will be some tree files, so we already started on the tree file development for the positioning, mainly uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the primer preprocessor. Um, there will be some uh, you know, some, capa uh, uh, some capabilities uh, to extract them, uh, uh, to extract uh, uh, different injury risks here, and um, finally there will also be a document. Um, where, we also, uh, uh, where we already started, um, and of course there will be, uh, uh, there, will be uh, there will be full support for the model uh, from uh, Dynamo. So uh, that's it. And um, if you have any questions, any suggestions, or uh, or critics, please. Uh, uh, so it would be nice if you contact us and maybe we can start a little discussions here and um, yeah, it sounds strange, but we are, uh, uh, we are, actually, uh, we are actually very interested in this, uh, yeah, so basically in any concerns, in any critics, since this would be something um, uh, 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 where we could learn uh, what to do with the model. So if we can start any that would be great. I think we have some t uh, some time. Or uh, so, um, is there any questions here? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank great. you, Dirk. Thank yeah. you, Dirk, um, yeah. for the talk. Um, so basically, this was an outview about future aspects. What we're going to do with uh, Hans? On. Okay. There's yeah. Some, uh, That's better now. Yeah. You have to go a little bit this way. <laughs> okay. Um, is there any questions from the audience? Comments, remarks. I mean, if you have comments, remarks, hans at dynamo.de, yeah. right? This is the yeah. page. Yeah, the, it goes directly to you and to Alex. Yeah. You, you're the receiving one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So that goes directly through to us. And, and so uh, uh, we can also personally, uh, yeah. yeah. May I ask you, what is exactly what you're working on right now? I mean, uh, there was this um, idea, what Alex was showing in the beginning with the uh, the muscle tension to account for that, that we don't have this kind of slobby behavior? Is it that yeah. like this, what you're curling on intensively? Or? Um, that was something we really needed when, uh, uh, when doing this extreme positioning, since mm -hmm. there's a, uh, uh, so we, had a lot, uh, we had a lot of slack in the muscles, mm -hmm. and then so we implemented this PID controller for the muscles uh, together with, with this macrofiber stuff. And that's, some, that's definitely something that we will uh, 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 we will go on to work on uh, since this is a very promising uh, uh, approach, especially with very large deformations, so with very large uh, uh, posture changes. Mm -hmm. I think it won't be that uh, uh, that important with small posture changes, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. So it, and this is the first first try to to or first approach uh, 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 to include you know, some kind of reactive muscle mm -hmm. here. And, um, we, are you going to use this approach for the entire body or just for specific regions? I mean, I think that it actually applies to the whole yeah. body actually, somehow. Yeah, of, right? that, would be, um, that, that would be a goal, but in the moment we just applied it to, uh, uh, to different models that basically under, under, undergo compressive deformations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, wait, the, so it would be a lot. The bending motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah you have the slack of, of the course. material. And but in the end, we will definitely have it for. You know, that's virtually every model. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're scheduling the, the release for R12 then, or is it going to be in R14, or what's your goal here? 
Yeah, we have to see. So our development version now is R R12, and we will stay with R R12 since this will probably, or this is the next, uh, or this is uh, the current development version. Mm -hmm. um, also for uh, for uh, for most of the customers, and um, but we will definitely do a cross check later on with R13, R14, whatever, mm -hmm. um, depending on what what version uh, people will need mm -hmm. then. Do you, do you expect it will be also downward compatibility to let's say maybe an R39, which was which yeah. is really common in automotive still they're switching, but or do you see any yeah, problems by difficult. the way? Since we have some features in that uh, actually don't work with R R9, mm -hmm. actually. So I I tried the R9 version a couple of months ago, but uh, mm -hmm. this actually didn't okay. didn't really work. So um, but there has been a lot of changes on the model since then. So maybe. <laughs> Okay. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. okay, it was just a curiosity question because yeah, sometimes yeah. people are asking, okay, yeah. is it yeah, also yeah, working yeah, with? So, yeah, I know, I know. Okay, I know. so we know. Yeah, but now. eventually, I think most of the, of the, uh, most of the customers will uh, transition to R12 anyway, mm -hmm. so at some point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's already outdated R12, yeah. so, <laughs> yeah, so they should. Okay. We'll see. Still, ah, there's one from Karin. Thanks for a nice talk from lightness so I, I was wondering it's not really clear to me what are the kind of output you will get from this model because you said you focus on kinematics yeah and for impact but so yep. what is it that you will be getting out yeah the the idea is to model the, uh, uh, the human body as as realistic as possible and then to uh, uh, since uh, so what's basically on the market now is um, is some uh, uh, some kind of uh, 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 some kind of simplified models. So they have a lot of smeared mat uh, materials, so smearing between muscles, between uh, flesh, between skin, and uh, they might be tuned for specific load cases. But the uh, but the goal is to have a uh, uh, to have a human body model which is uh, able to uh, uh, to cover all kind of loading. And, and so we basically hope that we can, through this uh, very detailed modeling, uh, uh, that we can go one step further. So, yeah. Can, can I I'll follow up? I was, probably wasn't clear in my question. Because yeah. I think if we are after kinematics, yeah. then we could just as well go for multi-body models, right? Without this complexity and having all this real detail. So, so that's why I'm sort of, to get the benefit of the anatomical detail um, and the resolution you're aiming for, yeah. um, I, I would like to see other output than just kinematics. I'm thinking I mean, like injury predictions and yeah, what this, kind of... Uh, uh, that's just the first step uh, uh, so to, uh, to reflect uh, the correct kinematics. So, but we still would want to have a, a a real human body model that we can use first of all, uh, first of all uh, to uh, 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 to model the complete kinematic uh, uh, behavior, but uh, uh, but also different injuries, uh, different loading scenarios, whatever. So that's sort so of part of the validations you were saying. Is that hmm? is that part of your validations? And that you were saying that you will also validate the injury yeah. criteria and yeah. work. Yeah, of course. That's Thanks. Uh, that's something that we will definitely do. Um, not sure when, because first uh, we aim to have a yeah, so a running model, but this will be uh, uh, this will be definitely uh, 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 this will be definitely another topic. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, another question, comment. Okay. If this is not the case, then uh, thank okay. you, Dirk. Yep. This was basic. Ah. Okay. <laughs> So again, uh, thank you very much for the in interesting presentation. My question is um, uh, concerning the, the brain model. So do you rely on, on, the, on the CAD data that you got from Psygoti, or do you rely on uh, yeah, the brain uh, model is brain actually working, that is work in progress? Available. So the, uh, the, the brain model is work in progress. So uh, at this point, we, don't, uh, we, uh, we do not really have a brain. Uh, so we have data, we have some CAD data, but uh, we have to work on this and, and figure out how we, in, how we basically include the brain into the head. 
So this will be also done in the next couple of weeks. So at this point, yeah, there is no brain actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's just a geometry. <laughs> okay. Something else? No? Okay, so again, okay. thank you, Dirk. <laughs> what? Ah, sorry, Dirk. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a question. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, thanks again, Dirk, for the, for the presentation. Um, yeah, maybe it's, it's a bit early, but um, if you look more in the future, what, what are your plans? Uh, do you want to, to create maybe a 50% female, or are you, go, are you going to create a TB24 uh, family? So is there, is there any plan? Yeah, so the current plan is to, uh, to get this model to work. Uh, but we know, we know of course, um, and we've seen this in uh, some uh, presentations today, that there are, uh, yeah, uh, uh, that the population is a little bit, a little bit more than, uh, than the AM50 model. Uh, and I think we have the opportunity to get access uh, for a 50% female CID data, um, which I know that we have to do at some point. Um, and starting with this 50 percentile uh, female, at male data, we, we can certainly easily scale to the other sizes, uh, 95 percentile, and, and, and so I'm not sure about the 5 percentile female since it's very tiny. <laughs> uh, but we know that, and we know that we have to do something here in this area. Uh, but at this point, we are focusing on this model, and um, this is something yeah, for later. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, is there another question? <laughs> Dirk, you want to just walk this way and then... I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have to come here, then the questions are popping up. No? Okay. Okay, <laughs> Dirk, yeah, thank uh, you. There was some feedback here, so that's why I... Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you again, Dirk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so basically, that's the end of the day. Um, so before we close it, I want to just give you a brief summary. Um, yeah, basically the whole information day was like um, planned around uh, Hans, our new human body modeling. And so far we didn't come up with some kind of meaning for the acronym Hans. So we didn't know what H, A, N, and S is meaning. But uh, if you have ideas, info at Dynamo is the place to go. Yeah, if you have an idea, which is maybe human anatomy for numerical simulation, safety, whatever, something like this, maybe. Anyway. So um, we have seen today that it's quite complex. The human body is a pretty complex um, physical system of interacting physical systems. Um, you can start from the very low end, yeah, starting with the skeleton, then putting all the muscle, the tissues up, f uh, building also the, the inner, inner organs, the skin, and so on. You can go more macroscopic approach where you try to muscle muscle activation. You can go really small on a small scale, yeah, if you want to have some kind of uh, osmosis pressures, um, diffusive effects to model, for instance, cancer growth. So there's a great variety of modeling approaches. And like I said in the beginning, um, it all comes down to what do you want to actually know. So what is what you want to know defines what kind of model you're creating. Yeah? So think about this, this quote from George E.P. Box, by the way, we also have in our introductory class is, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Yeah? So you tailor your model to your very specific application. I also want to thank all the speakers, especially the guest speakers, of course, also people from Dynamo being the speaker today, the guest speakers from uh, Fraunhofer, University of Stuttgart, University Gustav Eisfeld and Leibniz Biodesign. And I also want to remind you again um, of our upcoming conference in fall this year in Baden-Baden, pretty nice location, the European LS Diner Conference, online, on-site. So you have still some time till 12th of May to do something, produce some results, and then apply for a uh, uh, presentation. Yeah, it's uh, like two weeks. You have still to go up out. Yeah, so we maybe have a deadline extension, so a little bit more. But if you want to contribute, feel free to uh, register and submit something. Okay. With that being said, I thank everyone here. I thank also everyone outside on the internet joining us, listening us. Slides and uh, videos will be published online later, as far as possible. Yeah. Sometimes there are some restrictions, copyright or somehow, but we do our best to uh, publish everything online if you want to see it later. And with that being said, thank you everyone and goodbye.